Hey readers, as you probably have figured out by now, I am a huge audiobook fan. I do most of my own reading in audiobook form. I just don't have a ton of time to, you know, sit down with an ebook or a, a paper copy and read, but I do have a lot of time that I can listen to audiobooks and it's one of my favorite ways to consume audio. If you would rather read, you can go to my website, lindsayarmstrong.com. You can join my newsletter and you'll get promised to stay for free when you join along with Meet Your Match and Taming the Prince. So that's kind of fun. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoy it. Make sure to subscribe to my channel so that you can find out when I post more audiobooks and happy listening. Promise to Stay A Second Chances in Sapphire Cove Romance Written by Lindsay Armstrong Absence Sharpens Love Presence Strengthens It Thomas Fuller Chapter 1 when Aspen left Sapphire Cove four years ago, she planned to come home eventually. But eventually had turned into now, and she was seriously regretting her decision. In the far right lane, she crawled along the highway, a full five miles an hour beneath the speed limit. Cars whipped past on her left. On her right, a dense canopy of trees crowded out the sunlight. Barely an hour outside of Sapphire Cove, she chewed her bubble gum furiously while her stomach writhed like she'd swallowed a school of fish. Why had she agreed to help out at the family in over spring break? That was what she got for trying to be a good daughter, for trying to make up for her unexpected birth derailing both her parents' lives. The radio cut out mid-lyric, the soft croon of the pop singer replaced by the buzz of her ringing phone. Call from Cheyenne, her car's robo voice said. The fish in Aspen's stomach calmed at the mention of her roommate and best friend. She pressed a button on her steering wheel, answering the call. Hey, Che. Hey. Just calling to see how you're doing. Did you make it to Sapphire Cove? Not yet. Another hour or so, and I should be there. She might even be able to stretch the drive another 70 minutes if she took the scenic route. Aspen blew a bubble, easing her foot off the gas so her speed slipped another mile or two below the limit. Silence boomed across the line louder than any question. Aspen could guess Cheyenne's thoughts. It was only a four-hour drive from Portland to Sapphire Cove, and Aspen had left their small off-campus apartment nearly five hours ago. Did you have car trouble? Cheyenne asked. I told you not to buy one of those new cars, with more computer chips than engine parts. Cheyenne would say that. The mechanical genius's idea of a fun weekend was spending it under the hood of her classic convertible. Aspen barely knew how to change a tire, so she'd opted to buy something fresh off the lot, even if the car payments stretched her modest budget. I didn't have car trouble. I stopped for lunch and there was this cute little gift shop, so I browsed there for a while. Oh, I get it. Cheyenne's voice grew lighter, the immediate worry gone. You're procrastinating. Aspen rolled her eyes and signaled to get off at the next exit. Yeah, she was definitely opting for the slower route through half a dozen small beachside towns, not because it would add another 30 minutes to her drive, but because it had been a while and would make for a picturesque view. I'm not procrastinating. Uh-huh. Are you sure you're okay? I know this is a hard day for you. Aspen flinched, the reminder slashing like a whip. She'd done her best to not think about it. Trust Cheyenne to bring it up. March 24th is just like any other day. I'm over it. A total lie. When Elliot had called off the wedding last month, Aspen had been floored. They'd only known each other a year but her parents had adored Elliot, and Aspen had been comfortable with him in a way she hadn't been with a man since high school. Since Dan. She glanced at her dashboard clock, heart lurching. Right about now, she would have been standing under an archway of flowers at the clubhouse, Elliot's hands in hers as they gazed into each other's eyes and said I do. Instead, she was heading back to the town she'd run away from. Elliot was supposed to be the safe choice. The choice that wouldn't leave her. Cheyenne sighed, the sound crackling across the phone line. I'm so sorry, Aspen. I wasn't sure if you would want me to bring it up or ignore it, but I also didn't want you to think I'd forgotten about it. Aspen popped her gum, trying to calm her emotions. 
It wasn't Cheyenne's fault that every man Aspen loved eventually left her. I'm fine, Che. Really. Good riddance to Mr. Fancy Pants. Which wasn't really fair to Elliot. He'd been a perfect gentleman, even when telling her they were wrong for each other. Even when confessing he'd been caught up in the moment and didn't truly love her. That had hurt a lot. It had brought back another painful memory, and she hadn't liked that at all. I wish I could have come with you, Cheyenne said. But you can call me any time, day or night. Thanks. How's your mom doing? A loaded pause. She's doing really good today. I think she's finally turned a corner. An outright lie, Aspen was certain. Cheyenne was in total denial of her mother's drug addiction, but Aspen wouldn't push the issue, at least not today. Text me when you get to Sapphire Cove so I know you made it, Cheyenne said. Miss you. A lump formed in Aspen's throat. When she and Cheyenne had been assigned as roommates freshman year, Cheyenne's prickly exterior had convinced Aspen they would never do more than tolerate each other. But they'd become best friends, and Aspen didn't know how she would have gotten through the last few years without her. Miss you too. She ended the call, and music filtered through the speakers again, an upbeat rock song with an electric guitar. Aspen slowed her speed further as she entered the city limits of the first beachside town. She and Dan had come there together not long after they started dating. Dan had just gotten his driver's license, and they'd been ecstatic at their newfound freedom. Her parents had been less thrilled with their plans, and it had taken nearly an hour of arguing before they'd let her go. Aspen swatted away the memories. She supposed it was natural to get lost in the past, considering where she was. But Dan had made his feelings pretty clear during their breakup, and he was currently enjoying life without her at a college in Iowa. The sea breeze drifted through her open window, playing with tendrils of her hair. Crashing waves mixed with the caw of seagulls, and a few tourists bundled up in jackets wandered through the sand. It was only the last week of March, still a little early for most tourists, but in another few months, they would swarm these beaches. She'd missed this. Missed the slower pace of small-town living. Aspen had been restless in high school, always eager for the next adventure, and her parents had encouraged that thirst for exploration. That was part of what had made Elliot so appealing, a dashing foreigner with a love of travel. Mom had been all for that. She'd wanted Aspen to explore the world instead of getting stuck in a small town with a baby on her hip and an overworked husband to cook and clean for. The summer after high school, when Dan broke up with her, after she lost the baby they hadn't told anyone about, Aspen realized just how close she'd come to the same fate as her mother. She decided then and there to stop falling head over heels for boys her parents didn't approve of. She thought she'd done things right with Elliot, picking a man her parents adored. But that had crashed and burned too. Maybe she was just really bad at relationships. Her phone rang again, mom this time. Aspen took a deep breath then answered the call, keeping her voice chipper. Hey, mom. Did you make it to Aunt Marge's? We just got here, her mother said. Your father nearly killed us on the drive up. That semi was a mile away, her dad hollered through the line. We were inches from becoming roadkill, her mother shot back. Anyway, we're here now. Did you make it to the inn? Almost, Aspen said. It was close enough to true. How's Aunt Marge doing? Oh, she's nervous about the surgery. I'm glad we can be here with her. Thanks again for covering at the inn, sweetie. I know it's not the best timing, but these things can't be helped. I'm happy to do it, Aspen lied. Honestly, a root canal sounded preferable, but Aunt Marge needed gallbladder surgery, and Mom was her only family. You're a peach, Mom said. I don't know what we'd do without you. It's such a bad time to be away. With the inn currently in the middle of a remodel and time ticking down to the summer busy season, Aspen knew taking ten days away from the renovation wasn't an option, so she'd offered to come home during spring break and oversee it herself. She'd originally planned to spend spring break honeymooning in England. But sure, going home to face her demons sounded like much more fun. Tell Aunt Marge good luck with the surgery tomorrow, Aspen said. 
and don't worry about the N. I've got everything under control. They said their goodbyes, and Aspen focused on the road once more. All too soon, she passed the sapphire blue road sign sporting a lighthouse and proclaiming welcome to Sapphire Cove in swirly cursive script. Aspen chewed her gum harder, gripping the steering wheel. For better or worse, she was home. She reached Main Street and rested, her arm out her open window, waving at the preacher's wife as she drove past. Shops showed evidence of gearing up for the summer tourist season, and she noticed a new sign for Baylor's Diner being installed. Crazy how foreign and yet familiar the town looked. She hadn't realized just how much she'd missed it. As much as her mother complained about being stuck in Sapphire Cove, it had been a great place to grow up, and Aspen had never felt trapped there. Not until the breakup. Soon she pulled into the drive of the Sapphire Inn. The building looked just as she remembered it, an old, beautiful Victorian house with gingerbread latticing around each window and a wraparound front porch. A new wrought iron table and chair set replaced the porch swing that used to sit there. The porch swing she and Dan had loved stealing kisses on. Aspen swallowed. She'd known coming back would be hard, but she hadn't expected the memories to resurface with quite so much force. She followed the drive around to the employee parking lot in the back, catching a glimpse of her family's small one-story home through the trees. Three pickup trucks sat parked there, lumber resting in the back of one. Signs of construction spilled across the blacktop, bent nails, pieces of drywall, scraps of plywood. Ten days living in a construction zone in Sapphire Cove. At least she only had to oversee the remodel, the regular staff would be responsible for everything else. Who needed to tour Buckingham Palace with Elliot? She had all the adventures she could want right here at the inn. Aspen shook aside the thought. She ignored her family home and trudged the opposite direction across the parking lot, letting herself in the back door of the inn. The sound of drills immediately clashed with loud country music. Yup, definitely a construction zone. Mom said they were working in phases so the inn never had to completely close, and right now they only had three rooms available with the rest under construction. Time was definitely ticking to be fully operational before the summer rush. Aspen brushed aside the plastic separating an untouched hallway of offices from the current construction zone. Hello? She followed the sound of power tools. The noise abruptly cut off, though the music continued. Doors were missing from every room in the hallway, and she figured the workers must be in one of them. It's Aspen, she said. Uh, Aspen Porter. Bev and Ronald's daughter. Rustling came from one of the rooms and a man stepped into view. Aspen took a step back, her heart stuttering. He'd filled out since high school, the lean body of a boy giving way to the muscled physique of a man. He'd cut his dark hair shorter, and a shadow of a beard defined his jawline. Aspen. His eyes widened. Dan was back in Sapphire Cove. Chapter 2 Dan stared at Aspen, feeling like he'd been catapulted back in time to when she was his world. Her hair had grown darker, the blonde somehow tinted with red, maybe because her silhouette was backlit by the morning sun, which reflected brightly on the plastic hung in a vain attempt to contain the dust to the current construction area. She'd let some of her hair's natural wave shine through, which made his heart lurch. He'd always loved her curls, but she'd insisted on spending long hours in a stifling hot bathroom, straightening and smoothing every strand. Aspen. His voice rasped like he'd swallowed a gallon of sea salt. Dan hadn't seen or spoken to her since the breakup. Hadn't even said her name, if he could help it, too much pain was associated with that single word. Saying it now felt like trying to swallow a knife. Sometimes, when the Iowa winters got so cold his fingers felt frozen and he felt hollow with homesickness, he thought about finding Aspen and begging her to take him back. But then his mom had let slip news of Aspen's engagement, and Dan had finally convinced himself to let her go. She'd found happiness with someone else. That was what he'd wanted for her. Aspen folded her arms, drawing attention to the soft curves and angles of her body. The years had been kind to her, and she'd filled out in ways that said she was no longer a teenager but a woman. Dan Aspen stepped forward slowly, the thin foam soles of her flip-flops making him wince. 
Not exactly safe footwear for a job site. What are you doing here? He ran a hand through his hair, knocking loose some drywall dust. When he'd returned to Sapphire Cove almost two months ago, he'd figured running into her would be inevitable. This definitely wasn't how he'd pictured the meeting, wearing ripped jeans and a paint-splattered shirt. But here he was. Uh, I'm hanging drywall. Her brow furrowed. She took another step, one flip-flop covering a drywall screw missing its head. Dan rubbed his jaw, biting back a warning. She was a big girl, definitely capable of walking around a job site without him hovering, and he wasn't her boyfriend anymore. He wasn't anything to her. I thought you were at school, Aspen said. Yeah, I came home last month. Pops had a heart attack and needed help with the business. Aspen's jaw tightened, her sky-blue eyes darkening to a stormy gray. I hadn't heard. How is he doing? About as good as can be expected. This was so weird. No, weird wasn't a strong enough word. It felt bizarre to have a casual conversation with Aspen about his father's health when all Dan wanted was to sweep her into his arms and kiss her senseless. He thought he'd made progress toward moving on. Apparently not. What about school? Your football scholarship? Her accusatory tone made him instantly defensive. College had always been a sore subject between them, Dan hadn't had the best grades, and Aspen's parents had constantly badgered him about his plans for the future. Dan folded his arms, mimicking her stance, feet apart, shoulders hunched. I'm finishing my degree online. But you aren't on the team anymore? Dan clenched his jaw. Her parents hadn't thought much of his football ambitions, so he couldn't see why Aspen would care. No. Family is more important. Coach understood. Honestly, leaving the team had been a relief. Dan hadn't been getting much playing time, he was a decent wide receiver but not in the same league as his teammates. More importantly, he lacked the passion others seemed to radiate. To Dan, football was just a way to pay for college. Besides, Pops had needed him. The family business was important to Dan, no matter the porter's opinion of Sapphire Cove. What about you? Dan asked. Are you still in Portland? Yeah. She would be getting married soon, too. The thought of Aspen with another man, of someone else holding her in his arms and promising to love her forever, still hurt. But he'd made his choice, and he had to live with it. Dan had wondered every day since the breakup if he'd done the right thing by letting Aspen go. They'd been helplessly, madly in love. Then she'd showed him the positive pregnancy test, and everything had become so complicated. He'd been scared, obviously. But he'd also been determined to do right by her, to marry her and start a life together, never mind that they were barely old enough to vote. They were still trying to figure out how to break the news to their parents when she'd tearfully called him one night to tell him she was losing the baby. Aspen hadn't been very far along, but he would never forget how sad and fragile she'd looked on the exam table of the free clinic three towns over, where news would hopefully never reach their parents. After the miscarriage, they'd seen no point in telling anyone about her pregnancy. Was Aspen eager to start a family with her fiancé? Did he have some high-powered corporate job? the kind the porters thought fitting for the husband of their only child? Dan swallowed, glancing toward her left hand for a glimpse of the diamond that probably weighted down. Her hand was tucked into her elbow, her arms still crossed defensively. He forced words through tight lips and was pleased when they sounded sincere. I heard you're getting married. Congratulations. When's the big day? She flinched, her face going blank. Today. Or never, I guess. We called it off. Dan's arms dropped to his sides. Aspen wasn't getting married? She was single? Available? I hadn't heard. His voice was back to raspy, and he cleared his throat. I'm so sorry. She shrugged, avoiding his gaze. Thanks, I guess. He shoved his hands in his back pockets to avoid the temptation to hug her. Are you, uh, doing okay? That's got to be hard. 
Her eyes darkened to that stormy gray, once more, her jaw working the gum, she always seemed to chew. He could almost smell the sugary sweet scent from six feet away. I'm fine. So, are you only working on this project, or have you taken over as foreman for Pops? Dan recognized the subject change for what it was, and he respected Aspen enough to let it slide. He needed to sort out his feelings, before hearing details about her broken engagement, anyway. Who had called it off? Pops was in charge, but Mom's a nervous wreck. You know what a workaholic he is, and the doctor said he should take it easy for a while. Last week, I finally convinced him to let me take over a few projects. Dan hadn't asked for the sapphire in job, but when Pops had grudgingly offered it, he hadn't been able to turn it down, especially since Pops had only taken the job in a fit of stress over medical bills. Sure, the old Victorian house brimmed with painful memories. But Pops' health was more important, so Dan had accepted the assignment without complaint. Mom didn't mention you were back in town. Yeah. Dan scratched the back of his neck, uncomfortable. She didn't tell me you were coming to help out this week, either. Well, I only decided a couple of days ago. Of course she'd barely made up her mind. Today was supposed to be her wedding day. Instead of walking down the aisle, she was single in Sapphire Cove, doing right by her family even when it hurt. That was one of the many reasons Dan loved her. When push came to shove, Aspen chose to help others instead of worrying about herself. Well, I'm glad you're here, Dan said. We've got a tight schedule to keep if we're going to open all the rooms by the summer rush. He glanced at her shoes, those pink toenails making his stomach flop. She'd often painted her nails while they'd watched TV, and he'd loved the implied intimacy. Do you want to get settled, then I can take you around the job site? Sure, Aspen said. Let me grab my bags from the car and take them inside. I haven't been to the house yet. I can help. She hesitated, and for a moment, Dan thought she might refuse. Instead she just said, thanks. It was like he could breathe deeply for the first time in years. He followed her out to her car, a shiny silver Toyota he didn't recognize, careful to maintain a respectable distance. Aspen was here and single. What did that mean? Should he let it mean anything? Dan had never stopped loving her, but he'd also believed Mrs. Porter when she insisted Aspen would be better off without him. That she deserved the chance to explore the world, and her place in it, without a high school boyfriend weighing her down. That if she got married and had babies young, she would grow to resent him. Aspen had been noticeably different after the miscarriage, sad and aloof. Dan tried to comfort her but didn't know how to help. He was terrified he might do something to make the experience worse. Mr. and Mrs. Porter noticed the change too. And one day, about two weeks after the miscarriage, Mrs. Porter had pulled Dan aside and explained all the reasons why he should break up with Aspen. Practically begged him to leave her daughter alone. Dan was angry at the time and fought against the logic. But just a few days later, he caught Aspen perusing one of her favorite travel vlogs. Her face was alight with wonder, a faint smile on her lips. It was the first time she'd seemed happy since the miscarriage. That's when Dan had known Mrs. Porter was right, he had to break up with Aspen. If they stayed together, he knew how things would go. She would give up her academic scholarship to the University of Portland and follow him to Iowa. It would be too hard to pay for schooling and housing without that scholarship, so she would eventually drop out and support them both with a job. They would get married. Have a few kids. And just like Mrs. Porter had said, Aspen would grow to hate her life and his role in it. So Dan had caved. He'd broken up with Aspen, fully believing he'd done the right thing. But as the days had dragged on without her, it had become harder and harder to feel confident in his decision. I am sorry about the wedding, Dan said softly as Aspen popped open her trunk. She didn't meet his eyes, but didn't protest as he hauled her suitcase out of the car either. Yeah. Me too. He wanted to ask if she'd really loved her fiancé. If he'd broken her heart, or if she'd broken his. But those were stupid questions with answers he wasn't ready to hear, so he went with a safer one. Aside from that, how have you been? 
still a journalism major? Since moving to Iowa, he'd studiously avoided all news of Aspen. Now that she was back in Sapphire Cove, he wanted to know everything he'd missed. No, actually. I really missed working at the inn, so I switched to hospitality management. Whoa. That was unexpected. Aspen had always enjoyed the family business, but her parents had been dead set against her staying in Sapphire Cove. I really love the classes, Aspen continued. I'm the night clerk at one of the big hotels downtown. It's been interesting to compare a national chain to how we run things here. He wanted to ask if she planned to take over the inn after graduation, if she would move back home, but it seemed too personal. You must be pretty close to graduation. End of winter semester, she agreed. I've got two stupid classes, I couldn't cram in until then. You? Next year, Dan said. He'd never been great at school, and with football occupying so much free time, he'd taken the minimum credits each semester to ensure he kept his scholarship and maintained good grades. Are you still planning to be a physical therapist? No. I took a sports medicine class my first semester and hated it. I missed holding a hammer, so I switched to construction management. But you seemed so excited about physical therapy. He shrugged, not meeting her gaze. Aspen's parents had loved the idea of their only daughter marrying someone with a lucrative career like physical therapy. After stripping away those expectations, Dan had realized the truth, the field held no interest for him. A man's entitled to change his opinion. Aspen flinched, shrinking away from him as she white-knuckled the handle of her rolling suitcase. Yeah, I figured that much out. Twice now, actually. Dan's stomach dropped. Did that mean Aspen's fiancé had been the one to call off the wedding? He was such an idiot. Oh, Aspen. So, do you have a pretty young thing in your life these days? Someone worthy of the great Daniel Boyd? No they reached her front door and paused in front of the dated stained glass oval running down the length of it, surrounded by chipped white trim. Come on. Aspen rested a hand on her hip, her eyes flashing. You can't tell me you've spent all this time single. The truth was, Dan had gone on dates, and a few girls even tried to break down his walls. But none of them had measured up to Aspen. I guess no one's had what I was looking for, Dan said. Aspen nodded, unlocking the door. I should get some homework done tonight, and I'm exhausted from the drive. Can I take a rain check on that walkthrough and come by first thing in the morning? He wanted to say something to erase her pained look. Instead, he said, yeah, of course. She avoided his gaze. Okay. See you then. And she closed the door in his face. Chapter 3 Aspen hadn't intended to slam the door in Dan's face. As she dragged her suitcase down the hallway to her childhood bedroom, she even felt a little bad about it. But his words had cut like a knife and she'd acted on instinct, desperate to cut back. She'd dated him, despite her family's objections. Been prepared to put down roots wherever he asked, even though staying put would have chafed at the time. She'd almost given up her scholarship for him. Of course, Dan hadn't meant to insult her. He was too nice a guy for that, and he hadn't known Elliot called off the wedding, not until she'd freaked out and inadvertently confirmed it. Aspen plopped her suitcase on the worn light beige carpet of her old room, heat flaring once more. What was wrong with her, that every guy she committed to left? Her daybed still sat on the far wall, covered in a white eyelet lace comforter that Aspen's grandmother had made when she was only a baby. Aspen sank onto her mattress, the springs squeaking in protest. Yellow daisy wallpaper still bordered the soft pink walls near the ceiling. A small desk nestled against the wall opposite the daybed. She and her mom had found it at a yard sale the year she'd started high school. Together, they'd painted it white then stenciled pink roses on the drawer fronts. Aspen had been so proud of the results, and she loved spending time with her mom, just the two of them. A year later, she'd started dating Dan, and her relationship with both parents had deteriorated rapidly. Though Aspen understood her mother's fears, she still didn't quite understand why. Dan was a good kid from a good family, 
and he always treated her well. Sure, his dream in life had been to take over the construction business. But what was wrong with that? Had mom really hated marrying dad and raising Aspen so much? Aspen fumbled for her cell phone, anger making her actions jerky. She dialed her mother, her heart pumping furiously in her chest. She didn't even wait for mom to say hello. Why didn't you tell me Dan is overseeing the renovation? Aspen demanded. Her mother's heavy breathing crackled across the line. When she spoke, she seemed tense. What are you talking about? Aspen gritted her teeth, not buying it. I'm talking about how I showed up at the inn and immediately ran into Daniel Boyd. Why didn't you tell me he was back in Sapphire Cove? Didn't I tell you? Mom's voice was falsely breezy. Sorry, sweetie. I guess it slipped my mind. Things have been so crazy. I've been focused on Marge, and Dan only started working on the renovation a few days ago. His poor father's health hasn't been the best lately. Aspen pressed a hand to her forehead. Conflicting emotions swirled sickeningly into a pit that lodged in her throat. She wanted to cry. Throw up. Break something. I didn't think it would matter one way or the other. You two haven't dated in years, and you were so happy with Elliot, Mom cut off abruptly, her inhale audible, even over the telephone line. Aspen straightened, her ex fiancés name hitting her like a taser to the chest. Things had been easy and comfortable with Elliot. They didn't share the electric chemistry she'd had with Dan, but he'd made her feel safe and secure. At least, he had until he'd admitted to never loving her. Why did she have to deal with running into Dan on today of all days? She had enough to process, what with being a jilted bride and all. I didn't think it would be a problem, Mom said finally. He was only a high school boyfriend, and that was so long ago. But if you need your father to come deal with things, I can send him home. No, Aspen said quickly. How humiliating would that be? If her father showed up, Dan would know how much his presence affected her. Besides, Dad needed to stay with Mom. It just caught me off guard. Are you okay, sweetie? Today can't be easy for you. I wish I could give you a hug. Aspen grabbed her purse and dug around for a new stick of bubblegum, anything to distract her from the tears threatening to fall. I'm fine, Mom, really. Say hi to Aunt Marge for me. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay. Let me know if you can't handle things, and I'll send your father straight home. There's no shame in running. I know how suffocating that town can be. Aspen bit into her gum, chomping with unnecessary force. No, I've got everything under control. Well, if you're sure. Just focus on the remodel. The staff has everything under control with the guests. And you too focus on Aunt Marge. They said their goodbyes, and Aspen hung up. She pressed her fist to her lips, squeezing her eyes tightly shut. She had to pull herself together. Ten days, she reminded herself. She would keep things on schedule with the renovation, then head back to Portland. With a little luck, she would never have to see Dan again. Why did she still care so much? He'd dumped her. She'd moved on and was totally over Dan. Wasn't she? Aspen rubbed her temples and groaned. This wasn't about Dan, it was about Elliot. Of course it was. She had transferred her feelings about the cancelled wedding because it was easier to deal with past pain than present hurt. Her phone buzzed. Aspen unlocked it cautiously. She wasn't interested in discussing this further with her mother, not even through text. But the text was from Cheyenne. Did you make it there okay? Aspen winced, guilt flooding her. In the shock of meeting Dan, she'd forgotten to tell her roommate she'd arrived. Cheyenne already had enough anxiety over her mother without Aspen adding to it. She dialed the number, and Cheyenne picked up immediately. Everything fine? Yeah. I'm here, safe and sound. Aspen looked around again and found where she'd carved her initials into the windowsill when she was eight. The scratch marks she'd made with a butter knife were still faintly visible. 
Years later, after she and Dan had said I love you for the first time, she'd added a plus sign and his initials next to hers, with a heart around it all. She'd never done anything like that for Elliot. There was no lasting reminder of their relationship left anywhere. I'm so jealous. Does it smell like sawdust everywhere? Aspen laughed at the longing in Cheyenne's voice. Is motor oil and grease no longer enough for you? I appreciate all forms of fine craftsmanship. Cheyenne sighed. I bet the inn will look amazing after the renovation. Please tell me they're keeping the original crown molding. I think so. Aspen hadn't paid much attention to the plans. Maybe next time I visit, you can come with me and check it out. Aspen realized what she'd said when Cheyenne paused on the other end of the line. Is there going to be a next time? Cheyenne asked cautiously. Aspen chewed her gum thoughtfully. Eventually, I suppose. I mean, I can't spend the rest of my life avoiding Christmas at home. And she would graduate soon. Between her degree and experience, it made sense to take over the inn, however much her parents would protest. They'd never really discussed the possibility, but maybe. I guess you're right. I'd love to see Sapphire Cove someday. The wistful quality of Cheyenne's tone made Aspen's own heart ache. The social worker at the hospital keeps pushing me to look into this inpatient treatment program she claims works miracles. I don't know, though. It's so expensive, and it's in Harbor Bay. Hey, that's only half an hour from Sapphire Cove. Really? Yeah. I've heard good things about that center. Cheyenne sighed. I don't know. Mom's fine as long as I keep an eye on her. But you shouldn't have to keep an eye on her. Aspen wouldn't say that aloud, though. Cheyenne's father, a police officer, had tragically died in the line of duty almost four years before. Watching Mrs. Miller's downward spiral ever since, and Cheyenne's vain attempts to stop it, had been heartbreaking. It might be best for both of you, Aspen said gently. It doesn't hurt to at least do some research, right? Yeah. Cheyenne's voice turned overly chipper. So, is it weird to be back? Or is it nice to be home? A pretty obvious subject change, but she'd give Cheyenne her space. Heaven knew Aspen had things she didn't want to discuss either. It's weird. Nice, but kind of bizarre, too. Aspen ran a hand through her red blonde locks. I saw Dan today. Wait. The Dan? Just his name made Aspen want to run and hide. Yeah. Mom failed to clue me in on the fact that he's not only back in town, but in charge of the inn's renovations. Your high school boyfriend Dan? Cheyenne's tone was incredulous. That's him. Cheyenne was the only person in the world who knew about Aspen's miscarriage, well, other than Dan. They'd been cautiously getting to know each other that first semester of college, Aspen struggling to get past Cheyenne's walls. On Halloween, she and Cheyenne had gone to a frat party. A guy at the party had looked eerily like Dan, same brown eyes, strong jawline, spiky dark hair. He even wore a letterman's jacket. Aspen had already had one too many drinks, and at the sight of the Dan lookalike, she'd lost it. Cheyenne had managed to drag her back to their apartment, where Aspen had confessed the whole story, unplanned pregnancy and all. That night, they'd become friends, instead of just roommates. Aspen had never even told Elliot about the baby and Cheyenne had kept her secret. Isn't Dan supposed to be in Iowa on a football scholarship? Cheyenne pulled Aspen out of the past. Obviously. I never would have come back if I'd thought I'd run into him. Dealing with a broken engagement was more than enough to process during spring break. She had no idea how to handle working with Dan too. Aspen sighed heavily. Why does life hate me? I think a better question is, why is Dan back in town? His dad had a heart attack and needed help with the business. Now Dan's in charge of the inn's renovation. Wow. How do you feel about that? Like the universe has a horrible sense of humor. Aspen laughed darkly. I mean, isn't it bad enough that today was supposed to be my wedding day? 
And now here he is, the man who turned my whole world upside down. What am I supposed to do with that? Yeah, that's a lot. How did he act? I mean, was he nice or gruff or what? Nice. Daniel Boyd is always nice. Even when breaking up with her. Huh. She hadn't thought about it before, but he and Elliot shared that trait. Well, it's only ten days, right? Cheyenne said. Just try to avoid him as much as possible. Aspen flopped back onto her bed, covering her eyes with her arm. Like that's even an option with the renovation. Tell me it's going to be fine. Of course it is. You're Aspen freaking Porter, one of the strongest women I know. Ten days is nothing. You've got this. Aspen blinked quickly, affection for her roommate washing over her. Thanks, Che. What are best friends for? Survive the next ten days, and when you get back to Portland, we'll eat all the chips and salsa you want while binging horror films. Deal. Aspen didn't sleep well that night. She felt like a stranger in the room she'd inhabited for eighteen years. Had the mattress always sagged so much in the middle? When had the springs become so loud and squeaky? And why couldn't she stop thinking about Dan and Elliot? She rolled out of bed the next morning, more exhausted than when she fell asleep. Her bones ached like she'd run a marathon. And to think, she should have spent last night in the honeymoon suite of a downtown Portland five-star hotel. She should be on a plane to England right at that moment, her brand new husband sitting beside her in a cushy first-class seat. Elliot would have flashed her a toothy smile and asked how she slept. Aspen would have leaned forward and kissed away his impish grin. Was Elliot back in England yet? He'd said that was the plan. Had some proper British beauty who said biscuit instead of cookie already caught his attention? How long until Dan found his next girlfriend? Aspen took a cold shower, trying to drown out her thoughts. Then she pulled out her makeup and applied it like armor. There would be no exhausting plane ride to England today. No blissful newlywed haze to push aside hurtful memories. Today she would have to face her pain head-on. Aspen had finally run out of places to hide. Chapter 4 Dan awoke, before his alarm the next morning, his entire body tingling with anticipation. So stupid because Aspen clearly hadn't been excited to see him. He lay in bed and stared at the popcorn ceiling, unable to shake his nerves. The strong mix of excitement and dread reminded him of a kid on the first day of school. How would Aspen act around him today? For work, Dan didn't pay much attention to his appearance. He didn't see the point. By the end of his shift, he was always a sweaty, filthy mess. Most of his work clothes were smeared with dried paint and mud that wouldn't wash off no matter how many wash cycles he sent them through. But he found himself taking more care than usual to get ready for the day. Instead of reaching for the closest pair of worn denim pants, he found the pair with the fewest holes. He paired it with a worn gray t-shirt sporting the logo of a band he and Aspen had loved in high school, then carefully combed his wet hair. Maybe he should pull out the iron and give his shirt a quick pass. He'd let it sit in the dryer a little too long, and it was more wrinkled than he would have liked. But that would be idiotic. First of all, it was impractical to iron a shirt just so he could hang drywall. Second, he saw no point in trying to impress Aspen. She obviously was still upset about the breakup and he couldn't blame her. His timing couldn't have been worse. They'd lost their child. Aspen had been devastated. So had Dan, although he hadn't known how to show it. No one else in the world had known what they were going through. And after one lecture from Aspen's mom, Dan had bolted like a coward. He pulled a comb through his damp hair one last time, then threw it in a drawer, disgusted with himself. Aspen should be mad at him. He deserved every bit of her anger. The sun peeked through the thick cloud cover and trees onto the quiet streets of Sapphire Cove. Dan's truck spasmed like a vehicle possessed as he alternated between pressing on the gas and tapping the brake, torn between the desire to race to Aspen's side and wanting to stretch out the time indefinitely until he would have to face her again. He arrived first at the job site, not surprising since he was nearly twenty minutes early. 
Dan let himself in the side door and wandered through the rooms, taking note of what had been accomplished the day before and what they still had left to do. The inn's remodel meant he and his crew were systematically stripping things down to the studs and refurbishing it all. Once they finished working on six rooms currently under renovation, they still needed to complete the three rooms being rented. Finishing the entire project before the summer rush began in May would be tight. They'd hung nearly all the drywall, and today they would start taping and mudding. Aspen's mother had picked the paint color before leaving for Washington, a cool gray with blue undertones, but they only had a week or two of confirmed work left unless Aspen made some design decisions. Plastic rustled as someone pushed it aside, followed by a soft, hello? He would know Aspen's voice anywhere, even if the faint scent of bubble gum hadn't given her away. Once upon a time, that voice had meant everything to him. Now, hearing it just hurt. But Dan had a job to do, Aspen or not. He stepped into the hallway, lifting his hand in an awkward greeting. You made it. Yeah. Aspen looked around, one eyebrow raised. Where is everyone? We don't start until nine. Your mom didn't want us waking up the guests. Ah. She shoved her hands in her back pockets, looking as uncomfortable as he felt. He'd been so eager to see her this morning, but now he longed for the buffer of his crew. So are you going to show me around? Aspen asked. Right. The walkthrough. Yeah, of course. Let's start in this room. He gestured to the empty doorframe, and she ducked inside. Dan felt like a little boy sharing his painting with the teacher. What if she hated the remodel? Worse yet, what if she thought he was doing a bad job? Wow, you've made a lot of progress. Aspen sounded impressed, and Dan's shoulders relaxed. The layout's different. Didn't a closet used to be here, and the bathroom door was over there? The original layout had been chopped up and clunky. The old Victorian was never intended as an inn, and the original owners, Aspen's paternal grandparents, had squished in bathrooms and amenities wherever possible. The result had been a hodgepodge of rooms big in charm, but low in functionality. Dan had redesigned the space while his father recovered from the heart attack, and he hoped it would retain the charm while greatly improving the usable space. Overall, he was proud of his design. But he played it cool for Aspen, only saying, yeah, we moved some things around to improve the flow. I like it. Dan let out a breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding. Guests will too, Aspen continued. We don't get many complaints, but when we do they're usually about the awkward room layout. Not that it prevented tourists from booking the place solid May through September. Dan had always disliked the summer months, when Sapphire Cove's population almost tripled, but Aspen had loved the hustle and bustle it created, more evidence that Mrs. Porter was right about Dan and Aspen being wrong for each other. Except it had never felt wrong when they were together. It had felt utterly right. Dan cleared his throat, forcing the past to stay there for the time being. My crew should finish drywalling these rooms by lunchtime, and we'll have the first layer of tape and mud on everything by tonight. I ordered the paint yesterday but we can't move forward without some design decisions. We especially need you to pick interior and exterior doors, and the tub inserts for the bathrooms. Aspen's brow furrowed as she turned to face him, her confusion to plain. You mean my mom didn't pick those things yet? Just what had Aspen thought she'd spend the next week and a half doing? He glanced down at her feet, seeing she still wore the same pink flip-flops from yesterday. No, she was planning to visit the design center this week, but then your aunt got sick. So basically all of these decisions are now up to me. He knew that tone well, a little exasperated, but resigned. It meant Aspen felt forced to buckle down to a task she didn't find fun. Not a problem, Aspen continued. Where is this design center where I'm supposed to make all these decisions? Did my mom give any indication what she wanted? Dan felt like he'd been two steps behind for their entire conversation. She hasn't talked to you about any of it? No. I wasn't even sure I was coming until a few days ago. Right. She'd mentioned that yesterday. Sapphire Cove might be a popular honeymoon destination, but it certainly hadn't been Aspen's first choice. 
Did she miss her fiancé? How much had she loved him? I didn't really want to come, Aspen was saying. But of course Aunt Marge is all alone, and Mom sounded so stressed. She abruptly clamped her lips shut then chewed her gum more forcefully, her jaw muscles flexing with each bite. It's fine. I've got it under control. Can you text me the design center's address and phone number? I'll call and see if I need to schedule an appointment. I'll go with you. The words slipped from Dan's mouth before he realized he'd been considering it. Aspen's eyes widened, and she stopped chewing her gum. I mean, if you want help, Dan said quickly. I thought Mom didn't tell you what she was looking for. She didn't, but we discussed the design aesthetic while I was drawing up the plans, so I have an idea. That might be stretching it a bit. They'd discussed things like closet placement and whether making the bathroom a foot bigger was worth losing a foot of closet space. But Aspen was finally here, and Dan wanted to spend as much time with her as possible, whether it was healthy or not. Aspen nodded slowly, her shoulders still tense. That would actually be really helpful. Thanks. I'd call my mom and ask, but she's at the hospital with Aunt Marge right now. Have you heard an update on the surgery? Aspen shook her head. I don't think they're supposed to start until 11 o'clock, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Can we just drop in at the design center? Yeah, they won't mind. Dan had worked with this particular company three or four times before, and they were pretty laid back. How about we go this afternoon, once I finish up here? Works for me. What time? Now, his mind whispered. But Dan pushed aside the impulse. He had work to do, whether Aspen was in town or not. How about four o'clock? It's in Harbor Bay, but doesn't close until seven. That should give you plenty of time to look. Four o'clock was nearly three hours before Dan usually called it quits for the day, but Aspen's worried eyes convinced him to knock off early. I can go at four, Aspen said. Your car or mine? I can drive. Meet you outside at four then? Works for me. The thought of spending the afternoon with Aspen made Dan's entire body tingle. They would spend nearly an hour alone during the drive there and back, plus all the time at the design center. He didn't care how wrong it was to spend time with Aspen again. For four years, he'd forced himself to stay away from her. And he was done. Chapter 5 Dan tried to focus on work but thoughts of Aspen made that impossible. For a clock, seemed Ian's away. He wished he dared take off sooner, he could really use a shower and fresh clothes, but early afternoon was already pushing it. So instead, ten minutes before he was supposed to meet Aspen, he slipped into the lobby restroom. It was supposed to be reserved for hotel guests, but Dan decided a one-time exception wouldn't hurt. The porta potty wouldn't cut it. Dan did his best to clean up, using damp paper towels to wash the drywall dust and mud off his face and arms, then he rinsed his hair in the sink. He appraised himself in the mirror and decided his efforts had minimally improved his appearance. Aspen wouldn't care one way or the other, but Dan cared, and he couldn't stop himself from trying. Outside in the employee parking lot, Aspen leaned against his truck, catapulting him back in time. Sunglasses shaded her eyes. Tight gray shorts showed off her long legs, one of which was propped on the rear tire, and a shimmery hot pink top hugged her slender waist. But her hair captivated him the most. It flowed over her shoulders in his favorite soft waves. She'd called them beach waves in high school. All Dan knew was that they'd felt soft and silky beneath his hands. He used to tangle his fingers in those waves while they kissed. At some point in their makeout session, she would laugh and tell him to stop messing up her hair, everyone would know what they'd been up to. But he didn't care. He'd wanted the whole town, especially the teenage boys, to know Aspen had chosen him. She pushed off his truck with one leg, giving him an empty smile that made his heart ache. Ready to go? He was 18 years old again and dreaming of forever with Aspen Porter. With nauseating certainty, he knew he'd made a mistake that summer after high school. He never should have broken up with Aspen. Mrs. Porter had been wrong, so very wrong, but Dan had been even more wrong to believe her lies. 
He swallowed the acidic taste of regret and held open Aspen's door. Ready. She raised an eyebrow but climbed in. You still don't lock it? It's Sapphire Cove. What's the point? Until the tourists show up, at least. She grunted in agreement, and soon they were zooming down the highway toward the Harbor Bay Design Center. Where would they be if he hadn't broken up with her? Dan had wanted to marry her even before the baby. He wondered whether she would have said yes if they'd stayed together after the miscarriage. Probably. It could have been their wedding day yesterday. Instead of getting stood up by some pretentious snob, Aspen could have walked down the aisle to Dan. She leaned forward and tuned the radio, filling the cab with an upbeat pop song that Dan only knew in passing, not that Aspen needed to find the station manually. He'd never changed the presets after they broke up. Hers still filled the number one spot. So, what are we picking out today? Aspen asked over the crooning teenage diva obsessing over high school drama. Pretty much everything but the paint. Flooring, doors, bathroom fixtures, showers, tubs, vanities, the works. Had they gotten married, Dan would have bought them a little fixer-upper in Sapphire Cove as soon as they could afford it. They would have spent their weekends making it home. Aspen would have loved the adventure of renovating a place, maybe enough to make up for the lack of travel funds, and the sweat equity would have made the property a gold mine. Aspen sat back in her seat with a grimace. That's a lot. What exactly have my parents done? Dan quickly averted his attention back to the road. A lot of damage to their relationship, but he didn't feel right telling her that. Dan could have been man enough to let her mother's comments go. I mean, I know they decided to go forward with the project kind of last minute, Aspen continued. But I thought I'd be overseeing things, not making major decisions. No wonder mom was panicked. Why did they decide to renovate this year? Dan had been curious about that ever since Pops had told him about the job. Typically, businesses in Sapphire Cove started big updates in October, when things quieted down, so they could finish well ahead of summer. The Porters had only hired Pops a month ago. I think their tax return was more than they expected. I'm not really sure. That makes sense, Dan said. So, what have you been up to since high school? Whoa. Dan glanced at her quickly, thrown by the 180, but she just stared back, her eyes hidden by the sunglasses. Had all the small talk been a cover-up for the interrogation she wanted to start? Dan realized he didn't care. If Aspen wanted to ask him questions, he would answer every single one, even if the answers were hard. Not much. Classes. Homework. Football. You really don't mind quitting the team? Dan shook his head. I was a little fish in a big pond, and it didn't take long to realize the other guys loved the game way more than I did. I spent a lot of time on the bench, especially my first couple of years. That's pretty normal, isn't it? Normal or not, I really missed construction. That had surprised him, he'd complained so much, when forced to help out in high school. When Pops had his heart attack, I knew it was time to come home. But you're still going to graduate, right? You'll stick with the online classes? Ah, so that's why she was curious. Her parents had always insisted he would wind up a nobody who couldn't provide a life for Aspen. Dan clutched the steering wheel. Hopefully she couldn't hear his teeth grinding as he bit back a harsh response. Yes. And your coach really didn't mind? Like I said, I spent a lot of time on the bench. And my academic advisor helped me work things out so I could finish online. Dan's guidance counselor had been a miracle worker, and somehow, she'd managed to switch his four in-person classes to online ones nearly six weeks into the semester so he didn't have to take incompletes. Aspen stared out the window, so he couldn't get a read on her. I'm glad you're going to graduate. Your parents must be so proud. Where was this conversation going? I guess they're proud enough. And Mr. and Mrs. Porter would be shocked that the flighty football star intended to see something through. Even more shocking would be the knowledge that he also had good grades, a solid B average. With a little luck, 
Pops will retire and let me take over after graduation. He doesn't need the stress, and neither does Mom. Aspen chuckled, the sound almost as surprising as the conversation. If you had told 16-year-old me that we'd both be working toward taking over the family businesses, I would have called you crazy. Funny how life turns out. Yeah. This time he caught her wistful tone. Enough about me. What have you been up to since high school? Dan asked. Same as you, I guess, school and work. And the engagement, Dan said gently. Aspen sighed heavily. It was Elliot who called it off, but I guess you probably figured out that much. Hearing her ex fiancés name sent a jolt of jealousy through Dan. He wondered if it hurt Aspen. I wondered, but you don't have to tell me if you don't want to. I just didn't see it coming, you know? Aspen said softly. No matter how many times you get blindsided, it never stops sucking. She had to be talking about when he'd broken up with her. Had other guys broken her heart, beside him and Elliot? Dan instantly hated every one of them. He pulled into the parking lot of the design center, grateful to leave the painful conversation behind, even if temporarily. Here we are. Let's go pick out some fancy crap. Chapter 6 Aspen stared at the selection of bathroom vanities, overwhelmed. There were a dozen options in the appropriate size. How she was supposed to narrow it down to one and hope that the inn's guests, and her mother, didn't hate it? I didn't realize I would have quite so many choices. Aspen took them all in again. This is, wow. Maybe if mom had given her some direction, she wouldn't be so nervous. But when she'd called her earlier that day, mom had hurriedly claimed, I trust your judgment, sweetie, before saying she needed to go, because Aunt Marge was out of surgery and asking for her. The procedure had gone fine, and she would call Aspen later to talk more. Aspen was glad that Aunt Marge was okay, but later wouldn't really help her figure out what vanity to pick now. She hated feeling so indecisive, especially in front of Dan. Any suggestions? Aspen asked. Dan folded his arms, walking around the vanities and eyeing the price tags. She watched him, his shoulders hunched, his long legs taking careful strides, and her stomach flipped. He pointed to three options, a natural wood vanity with a dark walnut stain, a navy blue cabinet with a white marble countertop, and an option with white shaker cabinets and gray granite. In order to stay on budget, I suggest eliminating those three, Dan said. Aspen took in the vanities. Why hadn't she noticed the white one before? It had clean lines with sleek oil-rubbed bronze hardware. The granite looked expensive and modern but still had the country charm Aspen loved, charm the inn had in spades and that guests raved about. She walked over to the vanity, running her hands along the granite. A glance at the price tag had her inhaling sharply. What makes this one so expensive? Was it her imagination, or had Dan just heaved a sigh? It has 4-inch granite countertops instead of 2-inch, for starters. It's also made of real wood instead of a man-made composite material. He pointed to another vanity that looked similar to the one she was eyeing. The countertop wasn't quite as thick, and instead of the speckled look of granite, it had an even gray tone, with only a hint of texture. The cabinets had brushed nickel hardware instead of oil-rubbed bronze, too, but the shaker cabinet doors looked almost identical to the more expensive version. This vanity has a similar look to that one, but is about 30% cheaper, Dan said. Aspen pursed her lips, eyeing the two options. Why is it cheaper? The countertop is quartz instead of granite. Quartz is a man-made material. Since it's also more durable, it's usually more expensive, but in this case it's cheaper because of the thickness. The vanity is also made of a wood composite instead of solid wood but you don't need the real stuff if it's painted white. Aspen tapped her lips, chomping on her bubblegum. I don't know. I mean, the quartz counter only has a 2-inch lip, and the granite has a 4-inch. Don't you think the quartz looks tacky? No. One word, no explanation. That was so like Dan. Aspen rolled her eyes. Well, I do. Besides, the quartz is so flat. There's no texture to it, 
just a solid gray slab. Which was very in right now, come to think of it, but whatever. Another sigh. Dan pointed to the vanities they hadn't discussed yet. Okay, well what about these? Had she imagined the hint of frustration in his voice? Definitely not those two. She pointed to an option with a dated door style and another with a formica counter. And those three are too dark. Lighter palettes are more beach appropriate and it'll make the bathroom seem bigger. Fair enough. That leaves these three, then. Dan motioned to their remaining choices, the expensive vanity she liked, the more affordable knockoff, and one she hadn't yet examined. Aspen bent to examine the sleek, modern vanity with no knobs or dwarf poles and a shiny black countertop. I'm not sure this is the right aesthetic for the design either. It feels too New York or something. Not very Oregon coast. Which leaves those two. Dan pointed to the vanity he'd deemed overpriced. What makes that one so much better than the one that's within budget? Aspen chewed her gum faster. The countertops, for starters. Were you even listening to me? I like the texture in the granite, and that it's a thicker slab. Plus, the drawer poles are different. Drawer poles are an easy, inexpensive fix. Your guests won't care about the countertop, but we can probably change out the hardware for no additional cost if it bothers you. Both the countertops are gray, and they both look nice. Who cares if they have texture? I do. Dan threw his hands up in exasperation. This is like the prom vest and tie all over again. Aspen planted her hands on her hips, the back of her neck growing hot. Don't even start with me. Navy and royal blue aren't even close to the same color. Why would my tie need to match your dress anyway? For the pictures. She had been so angry when she'd seen the navy blue tie and vest, at least three shades darker than her royal blue dress. Mother's snide comments about Dan's intelligence hadn't helped things. Aspen had felt embarrassed and a little guilty, she should have gone with him when he'd rented the tux. It hadn't mattered, in the end. They bickered all the way to the high school gymnasium, but as soon as they'd stepped onto the dance floor, Aspen had completely forgotten about the fight. She'd been Dan's girl, dancing the night away in his strong embrace, and that had ultimately been more important than a photo. Dan's mouth twitched. He put a hand over it, but not before she saw his grin. What? Aspen demanded. Dan lifted his shoulders in a helpless shrug. I've missed this. Aspen's mouth popped open in shock, and she almost lost her gum. She recovered quickly, folding her arms in an attempt to block his tender tone. You miss fighting? I miss fighting with you. Then why did you leave? The question was on the tip of her tongue, the one that had tormented her. He'd been adamant during their breakup that it wasn't about the baby, but she'd never quite believed him. His other excuses had been flimsy. They were in different places. They wanted different things out of life. Long-distance relationships were hard. Why drag out the inevitable? Part of her had always wondered if he'd left, because he simply didn't want her any longer. Maybe she just wasn't the kind of girl worth sticking around for. Why else would two men who'd sworn up and down she was the one have left her? Aspen cleared her throat, looking away from Dan's piercing gaze. Maybe you're right about the less expensive vanity. Walk me through the pros and cons of both options again, please. In the end, she picked the affordable one. Mom wouldn't be happy if Aspen went over budget, and she supposed Dan was right, hotel guests were unlikely to care how thick the countertop was or whether it was quartz or granite. With the vanity chosen, the rest of the selections fell into place. In the end, Aspen was pleased with her choices, and she thought her mother would be too. Dan meticulously filled out the order form, the all-caps letters so familiar to Aspen from when they used to pass notes in class. The employee promised to get everything ordered right away, and in no time they were back on the road to Sapphire Cove. Aspen tried not to fidget as they crossed the city limits of Harbor Bay. Perhaps she imagined it, but Dan seemed to be driving slower than usual. Not that she cared. It was nice to spend the afternoon with him. Almost like old times. 
her hands fisted against her legs at the stunning realization that she wanted to spend more time with Dan. Things had always been so easy between them, from the first time they'd met. Being with him had been as simple as breathing, the only real conflict in their relationship her parents' disapproval. Fighting with him over vanities and tile choices had felt like old times. Why had he left her? Want to get dinner at Baylor's? Dan asked quietly. I didn't get a chance to eat before we left, and I'm guessing you didn't either. She should say no. Nothing good could come of spending more time with Dan Baylor's diner was a hotbed of memories, and sitting in their favorite booth would bring them all rushing back. It might even force them to have a conversation about why their relationship had fallen apart. Dan might want to talk about why he'd left, and she wasn't sure she wanted to know. Steely resolve flowed through Aspen. For nearly five years, she'd worried and cried and tried to claw her way back to happiness. Did she really want to spend another five years wondering what had gone wrong? Or was she finally brave enough to face the hard conversations? Dinner at Baylor's sounds great, Aspen said. I'd been craving their shakes and burgers for a really long time. Chapter 7 They got back to Sapphire Cove late. Most of the stores were still on off-season hours, and everything but the pharmacy and Baylor's was closed on Main Street. Only a few cars sat outside the diner, which looked exactly as Aspen remembered, a wide window with the diner's name and logo painted across it, the white front door with a vinyl welcome sign stenciled underneath the glass, a red and white striped awning which had faded some since the last time she was here. Only the sign she'd seen being installed on her way into town appeared new. Dan held the door open, making the overhead bell jingle. It was like stepping back in time. The counter running along the left side of the diner only had one occupant. As a child, Aspen had loved sitting on those padded red vinyl bar stools and spinning around and around until she was sick. Gail was still behind the counter, an apron tied around her waist with a little order pad tucked in one pocket and her ash blonde hair pulled back in a low ponytail. She was in her late fifties and had been a waitress at Baylor's Diner for as long as Aspen could remember. Dan headed toward the booth, tucked into the far corner the one she'd always thought of as theirs. In high school, a group of them had frequently hung out there together, but as their senior year dragged on, it had become just Dan and Aspen more often than not. She'd liked it that way, just the two of them. Aspen slid into the booth, and her eyes landed on the picture of Dan's high school football team. You finally got on the wall. Dan glanced over his shoulder, then chuckled. Yeah, I guess I did. You mean you haven't ever looked for the photo? Dan's eyes held hers, something in their warm depths, making her stomach curl. No. Aspen frowned. Why not? His brown eyes turned liquid with emotion. Because the last time I stepped foot in Baylor's was with you. We both know the photo wasn't up then. Aspen inhaled sharply, her heart skipping a beat. You haven't been here in four and a half years? He continued to watch her, repeating that single word. No. Aspen sat back, stunned. Dan had been obsessed with Baylor's in high school, had barely been able to go more than a few days without eating there. She'd assumed it would be his first stop on any trip home. Had Dan stayed away from Baylor's out of guilt over their breakup? Or had he worried the memories would knock him flat, like she had? The last time they'd eaten at Baylor's, they'd still been a couple. She'd fantasized that one day she would be Mrs. Daniel Boyd. Dan dropped his gaze, reaching toward the end of the table for one of the single-sided menus in a leather and plastic case. That's when Aspen knew, knew that Dan had stayed away from Baylor's because the diner was their place. He hadn't felt right visiting it without her. He'd given up Baylor's potato fries, a food he'd once declared to be ambrosia from the gods, for her. What did that even mean? Aspen slowly reached for her own menu, though she didn't need to look at it. She knew exactly what she would order. Think the fries are as good as I remember? Dan asked. I don't know. Aspen looked over the menu, noting that not a single offering had changed. I hope so. But sometimes memories give us rose-colored glasses, you know? The heat from Dan's expression almost melted Aspen into the red vinyl of the booth. 
I used to feel that way, but I'm starting to think that memories are actually a really poor representation of the real thing. Aspen tried to control her breathing. What was he trying to say? Gail arrived then, the pad she used for taking orders still tucked into her apron pocket. Well, 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 if it isn't my two favorite customers. She wore a big grin on her makeup-free face. It's good to see you two again. Aspen glanced at Dan, who looked as off-balance as she felt. Yeah, I guess it's been a while. Let me guess. Gail pointed to Aspen. A loaded cheeseburger with a side of onion rings and a large strawberry cheesecake shake for the lady, and the bacon burger with potato fries and a large coke for the gentleman. Fondness for Gail washed over Aspen. You've got a good memory. I never forget a customer, Gail said. Unless you want to order something else, I'll get that out to you in about ten minutes. That sounds great, Aspen said. Dan nodded. Can't wait. Aspen watched Gail walk away, pausing to chat with the man at the counter. I forgot what it's like in small towns. Aspen's insides felt warm and fuzzy, like she'd drank a cup of hot cocoa on a rainy fall day. At school, I order the same thing from the same coffee cart every day, but I don't think the barista could pick me out of a crowd. Some people hate small towns, but I love them. Sapphire Cove is one of the best. Yeah, it is. I've missed it. Dan gave her a pained smile. I'm sorry if I'm the reason you've stayed away for so long. I never wanted to hurt you, Aspen. She flinched. Everything in her wanted to flee from this discussion. But Dan was here. He seemed willing to talk. Was she really going to spend the rest of her life tormented by the past? Aspen fiddled with her silverware roll. I know things were difficult those last few weeks, but I never dreamed you'd break up with me. Dan's eyes filled with apologies. I knew it would come as a total surprise. I'm sorry for that. She flicked her eyes down to the silverware roll. The glue on the white and red checkered paper holder loosened, lifting up at the edge. Was it the baby that made you do it? Aspen held her breath, waiting for his answer. Their one night together had been the best of her life, but it had come at a steep price. If they'd never. But they had, and their relationship had collapsed in on itself like a dying star. Yes. Her breath escaped in a whoosh, and she tucked her hands into her lap, where he wouldn't see them tremble. And no, too. Aspen's eyes flew up to meet his. Dan ran a hand over his jaw, holding her gaze. It broke my heart to see you so destroyed. Then why did you leave? Her voice was thick, and she hated that he could hear her distress. I was so blindsided. You gave no indication that anything was wrong, well, beyond the obvious. Losing the baby had been hard. She'd loved that child, and losing it had broken something inside her that she hadn't known how to piece back together. I didn't think being together was the best thing for you anymore. Fury raced through Aspen, but Dan held up a hand, cutting off her response. I know now that I shouldn't have made that decision for you. I should have talked to you, explained my concerns and hesitations. I'm so, so sorry, Aspen. He'd only broken up with her because he'd thought it was in her best interest? Tears pulled in her eyes, and she opened them wide, trying to keep them from falling. I really wanted that baby, she whispered. The timing was awful, and I was terrified to tell our parents. But I was also excited, you know? Dan slowly reached across the table, giving her time to pull away. She didn't, and at the touch of his cool skin, goosebumps broke out over her arms. She should move her hand. She wanted to leave it there forever. I was happy about the baby, too, but we should have waited and done things properly. The words stung, and she cringed away from them. Are you saying you regret our night together? No. Of course not. Dan scrubbed his face, and the loss of his touch left her feeling alone. I plan to get down on one knee a few years into college. Watch you walk down the aisle in a church. A teen pregnancy and shotgun wedding was never what I wanted for you, but if the miscarriage hadn't happened, I would have done it. 
It didn't surprise Aspen that Dan had planned on proposing eventually. They talked about their future more than once, which was partly why the breakup had been so devastating. Even in her darkest moments, Aspen hadn't regretted their night together. She loved Dan so much, and that experience had been everything she'd hoped for and more. But she knew what Dan meant. Part of her wished they'd waited, too. If they'd done things properly, would they still be together today? Their food arrived then, breaking some of the tension, and they dug into their burgers with gusto. Aspen rolled her eyes in pleasure as the thick beef patty melded with the crisp lettuce, dense yeasty bun, and garden-fresh tomato. She pointed to her burger, not even ashamed to speak with her mouth full. You are right, my memory was a poor substitute for the real thing. It's even better than I remember. Dan nodded, enthusiastically grabbing a fry and dunking it in ketchup. I can't believe I stayed away from this for so long. I know. I'm definitely not staying away in the future. His eyes locked on hers. Me either. I can't kid myself any longer, I'm still in love with these fries. Like a lot. The double meaning wasn't lost on her, and Aspen quickly looked down at her plate, the burger catching in her throat. She took a bite of her thick strawberry cheesecake shake to wash it down, barely tasting it. Don't, she said quietly. Don't what? You know what. She took a deep breath, dunking one of her onion rings in ranch. She expected him to push her, when they'd been together, he certainly would have, but he didn't. Instead, Dan switched the subject to what had changed around town since high school and what had stayed exactly the same. Aspen relaxed at the easy conversation, content with the mindless chit-chat and delicious meal. Night had fallen by the time Dan pulled into the parking lot at Sapphire Cove. The inn's porch lights cast shadows across the weathered blacktop and moss danced merrily in the light. Stay right there, Dan commanded. I'll come open your door. Aspen knew she should protest, that was such a date move, but she sat quietly in her seat as Dan hurried around the front of the truck. He held open her door, and Aspen accepted his hand as she climbed out. Dan shut the door, but made no move. Aspen leaned back against the truck, her eyes almost level with his. When they'd been dating, she'd always mourned that her height made wearing heels difficult. She'd taken to wearing flats, and the habit had stuck long after Dan. She didn't own a single pair of heels, despite the fact that Elliot was unusually tall. Thanks for dinner. She sounded oddly breathy. It was hands down the best meal I've had in years. It was my best meal too. Dan's voice sounded odd, as if he were choking back emotion. And not just because of the food. Dan. I've missed you so much. We always had the best time together. Aspen crossed her arms, wishing she could read his expression better in the dark. The porch lights flickered across his face, highlighting his jawline. Yeah, we did. But then we lost our baby, and you left me to pick up the pieces all alone. I hated you for that. I hated myself. Dan took a step forward, and she pressed more firmly against the truck. Slowly, gently, he reached out, his fingers lingering on her cheek as he brushed aside a lock of her hair. Aspen's entire body grew simultaneously hot and cold. His hand on hers at the diner had been nothing compared to this. Even after all this time, her body still reacted the same way to his. Like she was made for him and him alone. Aspen. The word on his lips was more intimate than a kiss. I am so sorry. I was an idiot. I made a mistake, one I've regretted ever since. Can you forgive me? No. She wanted to say the word. Was pretty sure she should say it. But it lodged in her throat. She could no more deny Dan than cut off her own arm. Maybe I already have, and I just didn't realize it until tonight, Aspen whispered. Dan took another step closer, his legs brushing against hers. One hand reached out, caressing her cheek, again. Don't joke with me. Aspen stared into his eyes, dark onyx in the moonlight, and found complete sincerity in their depths. Hesitantly, she rested her hands on his chest. 
The cotton of his t-shirt felt soft beneath her hands, the fabric marred along the hemline by a streak of white paint. Dan stilled, his breath loud and heavy in the night air. Aspen spread her palms flat against his chest, feeling the rapid thrum of his heart. She could smell the bacon from his burger mixed with the pine of his soap. The years between them seemed to evaporate. Dan had just won a football game, and after he'd washed up, they'd gone to Baylor's to celebrate then spent too long kissing in the inn's employee parking lot until her dad flipped on the porch light to let her know he was watching. But no parents could ruin this moment, they had no rules to follow. They were just two adults with a lot of shared history, and time had done nothing to dim their spark of attraction. Dan's eyes searched hers, asking for permission. Aspen bit her lip, then curled her hands around the fabric of his shirt and urged him forward. That was all the invitation he needed. One hand rested on the curve of her waist while the other cupped the back of her neck, his fingers tangling in her wavy locks. Slowly, his lips lowered to hers. She couldn't remember how to breathe. Aspen slid her arms around his waist, closing the distance between them. His lips were the perfect mix of full and firm, and she lost herself in the sensation. Her hands ran up his sides, around his back, over his shoulders, while he expertly commanded her lips with his own. Their kiss was hot and cold, passionate and tame, and a million other conflicting words that floated out of Aspen's head before she could name them. It was even better than she remembered, a kiss she wanted to continue forever. For the first time in years, her heart felt whole. Dan pulled away with a ragged gasp, resting his forehead against hers. She felt the loss immediately and rose on her tiptoes, but Dan's words stopped her. I shouldn't have kissed you like that, but I couldn't help myself. Aspen felt like she'd been doused with a bucket of icy water. She dropped her hands from his jaw, feeling like an idiot. They'd been apart a long time. Maybe, for Dan, it had been too long. Maybe the kiss hadn't affected him the way it had her. What are you talking about? Aspen demanded. His words conflicted with his actions, one hand still tangled in her hair, the other stroking her back as his body brushed the length of hers. You just got out of a relationship. The tenderness in Dan's voice brought tears to her eyes. And I won't be your rebound. You mean too much to me for that. Elliot. Aspen dropped her hands to her sides in shock. She hadn't thought of her ex-fiancé in hours. What was she doing? Dan took two steps back, giving her space. Aspen turned her back to him, facing the door of his truck and pinching the bridge of her nose. She was supposed to have married Elliot yesterday. It had only been a month since he'd called things off, claiming neither of them felt the way they should when entering a lifelong commitment. Hadn't she spent most of yesterday's drive obsessing over the wedding? Maybe Elliot had been right. If she'd truly loved him, she wouldn't have forgotten their breakup so easily. Aspen dug the heels of her hands into her eyes until she saw stars. Getting back together with Dan would be stupid. They'd changed, and Dan was right, he didn't deserve to be her rebound. We should probably forget this ever happened, Aspen mumbled. I mean, it's been a long time, Anne. Dan's hand rested on her shoulder, heavy and warm. Awareness shot through her entire body, and it took a concerted effort not to throw herself back into his arms. I want to make myself perfectly clear, Dan said, his voice husky in the dark. This time, I'm not going anywhere. Her mouth popped open. What does that even mean? It means that I don't want to move too fast and lose you again. Take all the time you need to get over the breakup. I'll be waiting right here when you're ready for something more. She laughed bitterly, running a hand through her disheveled hair. Time? I've had close to five years, Dan. I've hated you. I've missed you. I've dated other people. I agreed to marry someone else. And now we're here, and I don't know what to think. I'm not talking about our breakup. I'm talking about your broken engagement. His Adam's apple bobbed, and his eyes turned pained. I know he must have meant a lot to you, and that's not something you get over in a day. But that's okay. I've got all the time in the world. He reached for her hand, 
and it felt so entirely right to be close to him again as he walked her up the walk to her house. But Aspen kept replaying their breakup and the dark days and months that had followed. She still didn't have a satisfactory explanation for why he'd done that. At the door, Dan gently kissed her forehead, the touch so light she almost believed she'd imagined it. Good night. Night. Aspen unlocked the door and let herself inside, her mind racing. What had just happened? She closed her eyes, breathing deeply. She and Dan still had chemistry, that much was obvious, but their problems hadn't disappeared. Her parents had hated Dan. They'd fought about it constantly, loud, screaming matches that usually ended with Aspen, slamming her door and sobbing into a pillow. They'd told her he lacked direction. That she deserved more than marrying a construction worker in a small town. Her parents had insisted that once they went away to college, Dan would realize he was too young to be tied down and he would leave Aspen with a broken heart. They'd been right. After the breakup, Aspen had determined that she would listen to her parents. When Elliot had come around, he'd been handsome and kind and fun. Her parents' seal of approval had made saying yes to his proposal easy. But then he'd left her too. Telling mom and dad that he'd called off the wedding had almost been more painful than the actual breakup. Losing Elliot had hurt her pride, but losing Dan had nearly destroyed her heart. Now Dan was kissing her and saying all the right things on the very day Aspen was supposed to have flown to England for her honeymoon. And in nine days, Aspen would head back to Portland. She sank to the ground with a groan. What was she going to do? Chapter 8 Aspen spent most of Sunday in her childhood home, the curtains drawn to discourage visitors. She had no idea if Dan and his crew were working, but after their conversation the night before, she didn't want to take any chances. Dan had said he didn't want to move too fast. That they had all the time in the world, he wasn't going anywhere. But she was going somewhere. In just over a week, she would be back in Portland. Monday morning came all too soon. Aspen was still obsessing over Dan and hated to face him. She closed her eyes, mentally preparing for the encounter. How had she gotten to this point? Elliot danced into her mind, his physical appearance so different from Dan's. Where Dan was of average height with broad shoulders, Elliot was exceptionally tall and on the thin side, with wide-set light brown eyes hidden behind thick black-rimmed glasses. He was a finance grad student with a sexy hipster professor look. And that accent. She'd been excited to live in England. A little scared too. Sad at the prospect of moving so far away from her parents, while thrilled at the idea of a new adventure. Elliot had painted an enticing picture of their life together, one with an upscale loft in London and Sunday brunches at five-star restaurants. But she wasn't sure whether she had really loved Elliot, or if it had been as he'd claimed, that they were more attracted to the idea of each other than anything else. He'd been everything her parents had wanted for her, stable, handsome, charismatic, ambitious. He came from a good family that was not only well-respected but, more importantly, wealthy. Dan had been everything her parents hadn't wanted for her. A bit of a rebel. Directionless, even for a high school boy. Too handsome for his own good, and head over heels for their very impressionable daughter. Oh, but she had loved him. She thought Elliot had erased those long-held feelings for Dan, but perhaps she had only been fooling herself. Aspen blew out a breath and forced herself to get ready for the day. After a lengthy shower, she took her time with her hair and makeup before eventually running out of ways to stall. As she walked across the grass to the inn, she told herself that Saturday's chemistry had been all in her head. She'd been caught up in the moment, Anne. All her arguments stalled at her first glimpse of Dan. He stood three steps up on a ladder in one of the bedrooms, his head angled toward the ceiling. His bicep flexed as he held the drill, a screw spinning as it came loose from the old light fixture. No, it hadn't been all in her head. She still loved Dan as much as the day he'd left. The realization stole her breath and glued her feet to the plywood subfloor. She loved him. Still wanted him. If Saturday night had been any indication, his feelings hadn't changed either. Could they possibly work through their messy past and really be together again? 
Dan glanced over his shoulder, then stepped down from the ladder with a grin. Hey. An ocean of unexplored feelings filled that single word, but Aspen chose to ignore them. It's looking good. She pointed to the boxes of new light fixtures stacked in the corner. One of the fixtures rested, carefully atop its box. That didn't take long. I thought it'd be at least another few days before we got any shipments. They had these three lights in the warehouse. Everything else is being shipped. Should be here in a couple of days, though. Aspen nodded. So, what's on the docket for today? It felt so strange, to stand here having a casual conversation with Dan, like years of unspoken hurt didn't lie between them. Start texturing the walls and ceiling mostly. He pointed to the light fixture, sitting on the box. Want to hand that to me? I'll hold it up so you can make sure it doesn't hang too low. Aspen carefully lifted the light, surprised by its weight. She'd picked a chandelier style as the focal point for each room. It had been more expensive, but she knew it was a relatively affordable way to help the infill upscale while giving the room some character. Dan leaned down, his fingertips just brushing hers as he reached for the chandelier. Aspen folded her arms with a shiver, watching as Dan effortlessly held the fixture to the ceiling. It was a unique design, with crisscrossing chrome rings, creating a sphere around the six candle-like light bulbs and shimmering crystals, which reflected the glow. Stand underneath it and see how much space you have above your head, Dan instructed. Aspen did as she was told and looked up. She was tall at 5'8", and the chandelier still hung more than a foot over her head. Considering the light fixture would be above the bed, it was perfect. I love it, she said. I can't wait to see how it all comes together. Dan lowered the chandelier, carefully stepping down the ladder. It's going to look awesome. You did good, Aspen. Your mom will be so proud. She met his eyes momentarily, then looked away. If she told her mother she still had feelings for Dan, how would she react? How would Daddy react? Dan set the chandelier back on its box, his lips pursed in that way that said he wanted to ask something but was nervous. I was hoping you'd allow me to take you to dinner tonight. Not at Baylor's, maybe somewhere in Paradise Green? I thought we should talk. Paradise Green, what Dan meant was somewhere neutral, where no memories would sweep them away. It was 40 minutes inland, a mid-sized town that boasted chain restaurants and big-name hotels, but no personality or charm. They hadn't bothered to go there much in high school. If she said yes, she would be agreeing to the possibility of a relationship. Aspen took a deep breath, then nodded. What time? How six o'clock? Works for me. Dan and his crew seemed to have things under control at the inn, so Aspen went back to her parents and decided to make sure they came home to a sparkling clean place. The house wasn't filthy, but the inn took up most of her parents' day, and they obviously hadn't had time for more than surface cleaning in a while. Aspen found a pair of work clothes in her mom's closet, pulled up her hair, and started scrubbing baseboards. By six o'clock, Aspen had deep cleaned a good portion of the house and, after taking another shower, changed her outfit four times before settling on a fitted pair of dark wash jeans and a dressy blouse in a shade of blue that Dan had always liked. She checked her reflection in the mirror one last time, then took a deep, steadying breath. It's just Dan, she whispered, popping a stick of gum in her mouth. But it did nothing to calm the butterflies in her stomach. The ring of the doorbell startled her. She glanced at the wall clock, four minutes to six. Dan's large shadow was just visible through the frosted glass of the front door. She opened it and inhaled at the sight of him, hair slightly damp and combed back, denim jeans hugging all the right places, a light gray t-shirt under a blue plaid button-up, sleeves rolled to the elbows. Well. Aspen struggled for words. You still clean up nice. So do you. His grin made her melt down to her toes. She stepped outside, locking the door behind her. You didn't need to come to the door, she said. His eyes darkened. Well, that's what you do on a date, and I was kind of hoping that's what this was. She lowered her eyes, murmuring a thanks as he held open the truck door for her. He climbed in and shut his own door but didn't turn on the truck. 
instead he swiveled in his seat to face her. His hand reached for hers, and the rough calluses of his palms sent her heart thrumming almost painfully in her chest. We can move as slowly as you need to, Aspen, he said quietly. If you aren't ready to call this a date, then it's just two old friends reconnecting over a meal. She knew if she said that was what she wanted, that she wasn't ready to date, he would accept her choice like a gentleman and not push for more. He never had. Their one night together had been just as much her doing as his, and he'd been respectful from beginning to end even in their inexperience. But did she want to slow things down? Or did she just want Dan? It's a date, Aspen said quietly. Okay then. Dan grinned, turning the key in the ignition. The engine roared to life and they headed toward Paradise Green. They talked about trivial things during the drive, Aspen growing more comfortable with each passing mile. Dan told her about his time playing college football, while Aspen shared some of her own college stories, most of them featuring Cheyenne. As they entered the city limits of Paradise Green, Dan asked, Mexican okay? She raised her eyebrows, impressed. You remembered. That it's your favorite? Dan shot her a meaningful glance, before slowing down for a stop sign. Of course. I remember everything, Aspen. They made small talk while looking over the menu then waited for their food to arrive. Once the steaming platters were in front of them, their talk died down while they focused on their meals. I want to hear about your fiancé, Dan said quietly. Aspen's head jerked up, her forkful of enchilada poised midair. Elliot? Dan nodded, his eyes soft and non-judgmental. If you're willing to talk about him, yeah. How did you meet? Aspen took a bite, giving herself time to think as she chewed. Talking about Elliot was painful. Uncomfortable. But not for the reasons it should have been. It hurt to talk about Elliot because it reminded her how poor her judgment was. I don't mind talking about it, Aspen said. Elliot and I met at college. He was a grad student and the TA for my business accounting class. We used to talk before and after class, but I had no idea he was interested in me until after the final, when he asked me out. She thought Elliot was gorgeous, of course, most of the girls and at least a few of the guys had thought so. And he'd been easy to talk to. Non-threatening. Safe. But she had never felt the fiery chemistry between them that she experienced with Dan. She'd thought that was a good thing. That it meant he was the smart option. Elliot is a great guy, Aspen continued. We only dated for about six months before he proposed, then we were engaged for four. He's graduating this semester, and the plan was to move to England so he could work at his dad's company. I was going to finish college online. They'd chosen England for their honeymoon partly for that reason. Some of the trip would have been dedicated to apartment hunting. Is that where Elliot's from, then? Yeah. She sighed. He's the one who called it off. Said we were great friends, but that wasn't enough for him. Ouch. Aspen reached across the table, gently resting her hand on Dan's. It was time to be vulnerable. To be brave. I think what hurt most was realizing he was right. I did love Elliot, but not in the right way. He was a good friend. Only a friend? Aspen nodded. I never told him what I really thought. I didn't get deep with him. We never opened up to each other. What do you mean? I mean I could vent to him about a professor who graded unfairly, or tell him about a bad day at work. But I didn't tell him about my struggles with my parents. She looked down, her cheeks burning. I never even told him about the baby. I handled things all wrong back then. I'm so sorry. Why did you leave, Dan? She'd asked the question before, but he hadn't answered it to her satisfaction. Dan blew out a breath, scrubbing a hand over his face. Because I was an idiot. Yeah. You were. She didn't try to soften the words. I'm done being an idiot now. This time, I'm here to stay. Aspen studied him, wondering if he meant the words. Nothing in his expression made her doubt him. 
one day soon, she would demand he give her a more in-depth explanation. For tonight, she wanted to enjoy being together again. She'd made her decision. That meant they only had one way to move, forward. Aspen smiled then turned back to her meal. I'm glad you're here to stay. Because so am I. Chapter 9 The next three days were blissful. Aspen spent most of her time at the inn, talking to Dan as she helped where she could. They reminisced about high school and shared tidbits from their years apart. But they didn't talk about the breakup again. When Aspen arrived at the inn Thursday morning, the hallway was filled with vanities that looked nothing like the one she'd chosen at the design center. Instead of the bright white cabinets with the clean lines and gray quartz counters, the cabinets were natural wood stained a dark walnut with gold swirled marble counters. A raised voice echoed down the hall, and Aspen peeked into one of the rooms. Dan stood, arms folded and lips pursed, while a short, wiry man held a clipboard out to him. I understand what your purchase order says, Dan said, his tone even and calm. But that isn't what we picked out at the store. You need to load these up and take them back, then bring me the correct ones. The man jabbed a finger at the clipboard, his eyes narrowed. Just sign the paper, man, so I can get going. You'll have to call the design center to see what happened. I just deliver the stuff. I'm not signing anything, Dan said. That says I received the correct product in good condition, and I didn't. Look. The man pointed to something on the clipboard. The item number is right here, and you can clearly see the corresponding item number on the cabinet stickers. I understand, Dan repeated. But that's not the item number I wrote on the order form at the design center. Aspen took a step forward, her soft footfalls against the plywood floor making both men look up. He's right, Aspen said. Those definitely aren't the vanities we picked. The man moved the clipboard from one hand to the other. I don't know what to tell you, lady. The hairs on the back of Aspen's neck rose as her frustration climbed from a one to a seven. I believe Mr. Boyd has made himself perfectly clear. We'll call the design center to figure out what went wrong and how to fix it, but in the meantime, we aren't signing for those vanities. You need to load them in the truck and take them back. It's settled then, Dan said. The man clenched his jaw while his face glowed red. He threw his hands in the air, clipboard still clutched in one fist. Fine. Fine. We'll load them up. Thank you, Dan said. The man left, barking at the three men wearing supportive back braces to grab the dollies and load the vanities back in the truck. I am so sorry, Aspen. Dan ran a hand through his hair, then pulled his cell phone from his back pocket. I'm going to call the design center right now and find out what happened. Hey. Aspen placed a hand gently on his arm, waiting until he met her gaze. This isn't your fault. I'm really impressed with how you kept your cool. That guy was a jerk. Dan gave her a tight smile. I try. He walked away, phone pressed to his ear. Aspen watched as he spoke to whoever was on the other end of the line. She couldn't make out the words over the clatter of tools and grunts of men lifting the vanities, but his voice still sounded calm. Dan had grown into an amazing man. She'd loved him in high school, but he'd been a bit of a hothead, coach, was always telling him to take a lap to cool down. Nothing awful, just a bit of a temper that sometimes made itself known with a raised tone and a harsh word. He was different now. Calmer. More composed. More sure of himself and his place in the world. Dan hung up and came back to Aspen. It appears that they put the item number in wrong when transferring it from the papers we filled out to the online system. They'll take back the incorrect vanities without charging a restocking fee, but they just delivered the last of their stock for the ones we ordered. It'll take 10 to 14 business days before they can make and deliver new ones. Aspen nodded, her spirits sinking. She would be back in Portland by then. Dan's shoulders slumped, as though sensing her disappointment. I'm really sorry, Aspen. I know this sets us back a bit. It's not your fault. Thanks for handling it. She placed a hand on his arm, 
trying to ignore the corded muscles beneath her palm. We'll try to make up the time as best we can, Dan said. Maybe we'll get lucky and they'll arrive early. Aspen went back to the house not long after to start cleaning again. She was on her knees, scrubbing the kitchen tile, when her phone rang. Hey, Mom. How's Aunt Marge doing today? Better, I think. She's still sore, but seems to be walking around a bit easier. That's good. I heard about what happened with the vanities. Yeah, talk about bad luck. Aspen squinted, scrubbing at a particularly stubborn spot on the tile. But Dan's got it handled, and I bet he finds a way to make up the lost time. Mrs. Porter heaved a sigh. You know, I was hesitant to let Dan on the project, but I thought. Aspen sat back on her heels, perplexed. You thought what? Never mind. I can see now that Dan hasn't changed since high school. Mom. Aspen was stunned. This wasn't his fault. Someone put the wrong item number into the computer. Whether it's his fault or not, sweetie, it's a setback we can't afford. As foreman, that's on him. Aspen shook her head, dropping her scrub brush to the tile with a clatter. You can't be serious. Setbacks are expected on any big project. You're lucky you haven't run into bigger issues. Why are you defending that boy? Mom snapped back. Aspen felt her temper rising just like it had back in high school, when they'd argued over Dan's worth. Because he's a good guy, and you're attacking him. Oh, Aspen. A sigh punched through the line. I'm not trying to. Maybe it wasn't a good idea to have the two of you work together. Aspen swallowed, clutching the phone. You say that like it was your plan all along. A pause. Don't be silly. Who could have predicted Marge's surgery or Mr. Boyd's heart attack? Aspen relaxed, her shoulders dropping. I just don't want you to forget who broke up with who, sweetie. The two of you were thick as thieves all through high school, then he dropped you so fast. He didn't drop me. That wasn't entirely true. We were 18. High school sweethearts break up all the time. Of course they do. I'm simply saying he hurt you a lot, and I don't want to see you get hurt again. Dan's a good guy. Aspen breathed heavier than she was used to. Was it hot in here? She pinched her t-shirt between her fingers and fanned herself, welcoming the flow of air. Just because he's a good guy doesn't mean he's the guy for you. What are you saying, Mom? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Just keep an eye on things, okay? We can't afford to have things fall any further behind schedule. Aspen said her goodbyes, mind whirling. Did her mom know something about why Dan left that Aspen didn't? And if so, why hadn't Dan told Aspen what it was? Chapter 10 Got the bathrooms painted, boss. Deacon, one of Dan's crew members, furiously chewed a piece of gum as he spoke. He was trying to give up smoking, the third time this year, and was constantly chewing nicotine gum to dull the cravings. It reminded Dan of Aspen and her bubblegum obsession. Aspen, whose trust he wanted so badly to regain. Had the vanity mishap done damage to their progress? She seemed fine yesterday, but he still felt tense. Not sure what you want us to do now. Vanities aren't here yet. Deacon lifted his shoulders in a shrug. Dan gritted his teeth, taking a moment to beat back his frustration before it ripped out of him with an angry retort. It wasn't Deacon's fault. Two weeks. Their project couldn't afford that kind of setback. It was the kind of thing that would further solidify Aspen's parents' opinion of him. He hoped Aspen was finally strong enough to keep her views separate from those of her parents. Lay the tile, Dan said. We were planning on putting the vanities on top of the floor, anyway. Will do, boss. Deacon walked away, chomping enthusiastically on his gum. Dan rubbed the back of his neck, the tension settling in. Why hadn't he checked to make sure they'd correctly entered the item number into the computer? It's looking good in here. Dan turned, unable to stop himself from smiling at the sight of Aspen. 
She wore a pretty turquoise sundress that showed off her shapely tanned legs, but once again her choice of footwear made him cringe. What was it with Aspen and sandals on the job site? She wore strappy white shoes with no heel that reminded him of a gladiator's. As reckless as the shoe selection was, he couldn't deny that they made her calves look amazing. Maybe one day they would be at a place in their relationship where he could scold her for not wearing something closed-toe. Thanks, Dan said. They're finished painting the bathrooms. Of course, the vanities set us back a little, but that's okay. We'll make up the time. I know you will. It isn't your fault, you know? The mix-up with the vanities. Yeah. Try telling that to her parents. Pops had received an unhappy call last night from Mr. Porter, who hadn't been interested in explanations. The country music paused, a brief lull between songs, and the unmistakable sound of a closing door echoed through the space. Dan furrowed his brow. Are you expecting anyone? No, Aspen said. It isn't someone from your crew? I don't think so. They wandered into the hallway, intent on finding out who'd stopped by. A man strode toward them, his tall frame and slender build backlit by the sun, which illuminated his thinning hair. Dad, Aspen said in surprise. Dan froze, staring at Mr. Porter. He hadn't recognized him in all the shadows. Hey there, Peanut. Mr. Porter pulled Aspen to him in a side hug. What are you doing here? Aspen's brow knit together, her tone thick with confusion. Dan felt like he'd swallowed a bucket of rocks, then tried to run a marathon. He'd always been intimidated by Mr. Porter, the man's distaste for Dan rolled off him in waves. Had to come see what the holdup was on this project. Mr. Porter shot Dan a calculated glance. The rocks grew from pebbles to full-on stones. Aspen bristled, pulling out of her father's embrace. What's that supposed to mean? Mr. Porter's expression softened as he turned to his daughter. Just that maybe this is too big a job for an inexperienced foreman. The words hurt more than a punch, and having them said to Aspen was humiliating. Sir. Dan had nothing to do with that, Aspen broke in. Dan's heart warmed as she rushed to defend him. If you want to complain to someone, complain to the design center. They screwed up the order. I shouldn't have to complain to the design center, Mr. Porter said. I hired a foreman so he would complain for me. I assure you it's under control, Dan bit out. It was getting harder to reel in his temper, but he was determined not to lose his cool. Two weeks of lost time doesn't seem under control, Mr. Porter said. We'll make it up, Dan said evenly. He felt like his 18-year-old self, being scolded by his girlfriend's parrot for trying to pin her down when she was too young. Though Mrs. Porter had been the mouthpiece, Dan had never doubted her husband had shared her sentiments. That conversation had destroyed Dan Mrs. Porter had voiced all his worst fears in a single breath. That he wasn't good enough for Aspen. That he wouldn't be able to provide for her. That she deserved better. That being with him had already ruined her life. Daddy, you can't talk to Dan like that, Aspen said sharply. You shouldn't have come home. Dan and I have everything under control. How's mom going to get back, anyway? You know she can't stay awake for that long of a drive. She came back with me, Mr. Porter said. She's at the house now, said she was going to start a load of laundry. We left sort of last minute, so she didn't have time to do any at Marge's, and I'm nearly out of clean underwear. You came home early? Aspen said. But Aunt Marge. For goodness sake, Aspen. Marge is a grown woman, and it's been over a week since the surgery. She's getting along just fine. We only came back two days early. You should have come back on Sunday like you originally planned. Don't be difficult. How about I take you out to lunch? Bev should have that laundry started by now. Aspen glanced at Dan, her expression tight. What would happen if her parents got her alone for a conversation? But the last thing he wanted was to keep Aspen from her parents. That wasn't a healthy way to restart their relationship. He would have to trust that Aspen was strong enough to weather their negative opinions. 
She turned away from Dan, giving her father a sharp nod. Fine. Let's go. Dan watched them leave, his chest tight and his heart beating fast. Aspen was only going to lunch with her parents. Everything would be fine. His racing heart called him a liar. Aspen's parents were back in town. And Dan couldn't help but feel like they would undo the past week of progress in a single conversation. Chapter 11 Where do you want to eat? Dad asked as they left the inn. His shiny red SUV sat in the parking lot, looking out of place among the dull colors of the work trucks surrounding it. Aspen quickly ran through the options. Definitely not Baylor's, she didn't want the upcoming conversation, which would no doubt be unpleasant, to taint her good memories there. How about that seafood shack on the pier, she asked. Her dad loved it, but Aspen thought their fish and chips were a little greasy. Sounds great, dad said easily. She wasn't surprised he didn't remember how much she'd complained when she'd eaten there as a kid. He tossed her the keys, and Aspen caught them reflexively. I'll go grab your mom, Dad said. Be back in a sec. Aspen grudgingly got in the back seat of her parents' SUV. She didn't want to go to lunch with them. It was beyond annoying that they'd come home early. A week ago, Aspen would have been thrilled to leave Sapphire Cove and scurry back to Portland. But a week ago, she'd still been mad at Dan. Had it really been just about this time last Friday that she'd rolled into town? The car doors opened, and her parents slid in. Mom turned to Aspen, giving her an awkward half-hug with the car seat in the way. Hi, sweetie. It's so good to see you. Yeah, Aspen murmured. Other than video chat, she hadn't seen her parents in almost two months, since they'd driven to Portland for close fittings for the wedding. The memory didn't sting the way Aspen had expected it to, but she pushed it away nonetheless. You should have stayed with Aunt Marge, Aspen said. Dan and I have everything under control. Hmm, Mom's pursed lips glinted in the windshield's reflection as her father pulled out of the parking lot. Marge is doing just fine, and we were getting cooped up in her tiny apartment. Honestly, I think she was relieved to have us go. I know she appreciated the help, but it's nice to have your space, too. She's feeling all better, then? Aspen asked. Not completely recovered, but she's going back to work Monday, Mom said. Thanks so much again for helping out. Of course, we'd love it if you stayed until Sunday, but we understand if you'd rather get on the road tonight. Or first thing in the morning, Dad said. I can take your car and fill up the tank while you pack. Aspen glanced between her parents. They would begged her to come home for years. Why were they in such a hurry for her to leave now? The answer hit Aspen as they pulled into the pier's parking lot. They didn't want her to leave Sapphire Cove. They wanted her to stay away from Dan. Aspen's entire body grew cold at the realization. Her parents had never hidden their dislike for Dan but Aspen had been certain of his love for her. So sure that nothing could keep them apart. What if she'd been wrong? She stayed quiet as they ordered their food and claimed a nearby picnic table. It was still early for a Friday, and the pier was mostly empty. A large Ferris wheel sat at one end of the pier, and the skeletal track of a roller coast cut across the gray sky. In another month, it would be crowded with locals and tourists alike as the summer season got underway. But for the time being, only a few other people were here, and none of them nearby. Aspen sat at the table, her greasy fish and chips growing cold as her parents chattered mindlessly about their week with Aunt Marge. You feeling okay, Peanut? Dad asked. He motioned to her basket of food. You've hardly eaten a thing. Been pretty quiet too, now that I think about it. Why did you come back early? Aspen asked. Mom blinked. Didn't your father tell you? We were concerned about the renovations falling behind. Aspen clenched her jaw, wishing for a stick of gum to chew. Dan shuffled everything around so you won't lose time. All that's changed is the order of things, not the timeline. They would lose a day or two at most. Mom wadded up her napkin, throwing it in her basket, with disgust. 
waves crashed on a nearby rock, seeming to punctuate her mother's obvious annoyance. Of course it wasn't his fault, Mom said, her tone scathing. That boy can do no wrong in your eyes. He could rob a bank, and you'd claim he did it for a good cause. That's not true, and you know it. Aspen spread her hands flat across the picnic table, willing her anger to dissipate. It didn't work. Hot fury coated every nerve in her body. No, I don't know it, Mom snapped. The two of you were inseparable in high school. This isn't about high school, Aspen said through clenched teeth. Mom waved that away. Of course it is. Everything goes back to that breakup. What are you talking about? Aspen asked. We were worried, Dad said. You seem to not care about anything other than that boy. Don't get me wrong, your mother and I love each other, and of course we love you. But we wouldn't have chosen a shotgun wedding when we were barely babies ourselves, Mom broke in. Of course we wouldn't have. And we could see you going down a similar path, so of course I had to. Mom froze, her face going pale. All the heat drained from Aspen's body as she watched the horror, the guilt, spread across her mother's face. A terrible, awful realization dawned. One Aspen couldn't believe she hadn't thought of sooner. One she couldn't believe her parents had been responsible for. Had to what? Aspen whispered. Silence. She slammed her palm on the picnic table, making her basket of fish and chips jump. What did you do, Mom? Okay. Mom's chest heaved, and she shook her head in anger and frustration. I spoke to Dan. You were so upset, crying all the time. The relationship wasn't healthy for you, Aspen. I went to Dan and pointed out the obvious. Aspen was stunned. Knocked over by a wave she'd never seen coming. You made him break up with me. Now hold on a second. Dad leaned forward. Your mother did no such thing. She simply explained to Dan why it might be best if you two went your separate ways. Dan apparently agreed, first smart thing that boy ever did. Aspen curled her hands into fists. I cried for months after the breakup. I loved Dan. Maybe she still did. And I tried to fix it, Mom said hastily. When you broke up with Elliot, well, I could see you weren't over the past. When Marge got sick and Dan came back to town. You tricked me into coming home so, what? We could get back together? Mom's nose wrinkled in distaste. No, of course not. So you could get closure. Dad rested his hand over Mom's, his tone firm. So you could move on once and for all. Aspen pushed a hand roughly through her hair. The deluge of information felt like trying to drink from a fire hose. You two are unbelievable. We acted out of love. Tears glistened in Mom's eyes, but Aspen was unmoved. Can't you see now that breaking up was the right decision? Dan isn't right for you. He can't even take responsibility for a simple project. That wasn't his fault. Aspen said. Mom wasn't discouraged. If he truly loved you, a simple conversation from an overprotective mom wouldn't have persuaded him to leave. He wasn't right for you then, and he isn't right for you now. It was like entering some bizarre parallel universe. Her perspective of the breakup had shifted, and now she was looking at everything with new eyes. So you just, what, went over to his house one day and ambushed him with this conversation? Her eyes swung to her dad. And you let her do it? I didn't know until after she'd already spoken to the boy. At the angry flash in mom's eyes, dad quickly added, but I supported her decision and thought she made a good call. If Dan hadn't broken up with you, then you never would have met Elliot. You mean, I never would have had a broken engagement. Aspen couldn't stop the bubble of hysterical laughter. I would have been happy. I would have been with Dan. If you had really let Dan go, you would still be with Elliot. Mom brushed away tears with an angry flick of her hand. I can see now that I shouldn't have assumed the breakup was enough. I should have. You shouldn't have broken us up at all, Aspen said. 
We weren't just two kids who liked kissing. We had a real, forever kind of love. Except Dan hadn't loved her enough to fight for their relationship. He'd bolted after one simple conversation from her crazy mother. But it hadn't been one conversation. It had been years of put-downs and digs at their relationship. He'd just lost a baby, too. Would she have fought for him if their situations had been reversed? Maybe Dan hadn't loved her as much as she'd assumed. Aspen stumbled to her feet. Sweetie, Mom began. She shook her head, backing away from her parents. I can't believe you did that. Don't be like that, Peanut, Dad said. Aspen held up a shaking finger. I don't want to see either of you right now. I'll come grab my things after you're asleep. Don't wait up for me. Then she was running, away from the pier. Away from her parents. But not away from the pain and hurt. Dan had never breathed a word of that conversation to her. He'd broken up with her and never given a reason why. Well, she was done being lied to. Done waiting for explanations that never came. Tonight, he would tell her everything. Chapter 12 It was a long, grueling day, but mostly because Dan threw himself into the tasks at hand to try to stop his mind from obsessing over Aspen. He'd forgotten how much tension her parents caused their relationship. Aspen had a deep-seated need to please them. In fact, he was pretty sure dating him was the only time she'd ever gone against their wishes. It had been a pebble in the shoe of their relationship that kept irritating, no matter how they tried to move past it. Would their relationship have fallen apart even if he hadn't broken up with her, because of her parents? Did he really want to welcome Aspen, and by extension, her family, back into his life? At home, Dan took a shower then collapsed on the couch, mindlessly scrolling through TV shows on his watch list in a vain attempt at distraction. He'd stayed with his parents when he'd first returned to Sapphire Cove, not sure how long he would be there. But when it became obvious Pops needed long-term help, Dan moved into an apartment a few miles away. Maybe he was back in Sapphire Cove. But he wasn't 18 anymore, and he wasn't about to live with his parents and be treated like a kid again. Just because he'd come home didn't mean everything would be the same. Dan was just getting into a home renovation show when someone pounding on the door made him drop the remote. Silence stretched across the room, then the pounding started once more, fast and angry. Aspen. It had to be her, Mr. and Mrs. Porter didn't know where Dan lived, and the only other people who ever stopped by were his parents. It wouldn't be hard to find his apartment in such a small town. Dan felt nauseous as he hurried to the door. He opened it to find a red-faced Aspen, her hand poised to pound again. Can I help you? he asked, keeping his tone mild. Oh, you're hilarious. In case you can't tell, I'm not in the mood. She pushed her way inside without waiting for an invitation and slammed the door behind her. I had to track down someone on your crew to get your address. Dan folded his arms, following her into the small living room. It wasn't much, a TV that took up an entire wall, a battered couch his mom had planned to get rid of, and an insanely comfortable recliner. Aspen didn't sit, instead facing him with her hands on her hips. Did something happen since this afternoon to make you so angry with me? Dan asked. But he already knew the answer. Lunch with her parents had happened. And Dan had lost his chance to tell Aspen the truth about their breakup. He'd never understood why Mr. and Mrs. Porter disliked him so much. It was probably a natural response for a parent, Dan was the boy who'd fallen in love with their daughter. They'd broken the occasional curfew together, gotten caught making out on the porch a time or two, and had even cut class together once. But Dan hadn't drank. He hadn't been into drugs. They hadn't attended wild parties, and while he hadn't been anywhere close to valedictorian, he hadn't been in danger of dropping out of high school either. As far as Dan could tell, his only crime was loving Aspen fiercely, that and enjoying life in Sapphire Cove. If Dan hadn't let Mrs. Porter scare him away, he and Aspen might have been engaged by now. Maybe even married. He would have continued to cherish her, to treat her like a queen. To do everything in his power to make her happy. The miscarriage hadn't been his fault, 
any more than it had been hers. I haven't spoken about you in years, not to my parents, at least. The tremor in Aspen's voice made Dan's heart ache. They were so happy when we broke up, and I couldn't handle the I told you so's. But you destroyed me when you left, Dan. I was a mess for months afterward. I'm not sure I ever got over it. Didn't get over it? An image of Aspen wrapped in the arms of some pretentious British pretty boy made Dan's anger flare. You were going to marry someone else, Aspen. She took a step forward, eyes blazing, and jabbed a finger toward him. I was supposed to marry you. He stood there, stunned, as her eyes welled with tears. I thought you loved me, she choked out. That night was the best of my life, Dan. I was scared to death to have a baby. We were too young, and the timing was all wrong. If I had known. She cut him off, her voice rising to a yell. But, like an idiot, I was happy when I found out about the baby. All I wanted in life was to start a family with you. And when I told you about the pregnancy, you seemed happy. Dan ears rang with the volume of her confessions. Where was this conversation going? Of course I was. That baby was ours. He choked on the last word, a physical ache making his chest hurt. Their baby would have been about three years old by now. They hadn't known the sex, Aspen hadn't been far enough along for that, but for some reason, when Dan thought of their child, she was always a girl. Then why didn't you fight for me? Tears glistened on Aspen's eyelashes like tiny diamonds. I never understood why you broke up with me, but now, she shook her head, dislodging a tear so it trailed down one of her perfectly formed cheeks. I did fight for you. I fought for you every day. Dan couldn't hold back the word vomit. He was done taking all the blame. Every time I picked you up and they put me down, I fought. Every time they diminished my dreams and mocked my lack of direction and insinuated that I was no more than garbage. Then why did you let her break us up? Dan rocked back on his heels, the fire dying. She told you. Yes. I forced the whole story out of her tonight, how she and Dad worried I was depressed. I was crying too much. They thought we were fighting, but of course they didn't know the real reason. She shook her head. So my mom went to your house and told you our relationship was hurting me. That if you really loved me, you should break up with me so that I could go off to college without any outside attachments holding me back. I thought she was right. Dan felt like he'd stepped into a sinkhole from which he couldn't escape, no matter how much he struggled. I mean, the evidence was right in front of me. I didn't know how to make you happy. You cried all the time, Anne. I had just lost a baby. Aspen put a hand to her chest, letting out a sob. Dan took a step forward, aching to hold her. To comfort her. But she held up a shaking hand and took a step back. No. I want to know why you didn't fight for me. I know my parents were awful to you, but was what we had so meaningless that one little conversation could convince you to leave? I was a kid. The words exploded from him. I was 18, and I'd just lost a baby too. The woman I loved was crying all the time, and I didn't know how to fix any of it. All I wanted was to make you happy, Aspen. And at the time, what your mom said made a lot of sense. You think I cried a lot before you left? Imagine how much I cried after you were gone. The painful truth of those words buckled Dan's knees. He took a step forward, grabbed Aspen's hands, and pulled her into his arms. I won't make the same mistake twice. She resisted at first, but Dan held her tightly, stroking her hair until she collapsed against him with a sob. Why didn't you tell me? Dan swallowed back his tears, blinking rapidly. Because I didn't think it mattered. No one forced me to break up with you. In the end, the choice was mine. I'm not excusing my mother's actions, but it should have been my choice too. If you loved me. Of course I did. Dan tightened his hold. I'm so sorry. So, so sorry. He brushed his hand down the curve of her cheek, tilting her chin up toward him. His lips found hers, and she returned his kisses, with hungry ones of her own. 
Elated, he eagerly pressed his hands into her hair, letting them get lost in the soft tangle of her wavy curls. Her hands trailed down his back while his left her hair to find the curve of her hips. He hooked his fingers through her belt loops, urging her closer. It was okay. They were okay. It would be okay. Aspen abruptly pushed him away. Dan stumbled, barely catching himself. No. She shoved a hand through her hair. I can't do this again. Do what? Dan demanded. Lose me? Because I'm not a kid anymore, and I'm not about to make the same mistakes. I've told you I'm not going anywhere. What else can I do to make you trust me again? I don't know. Dan inhaled sharply, the finality of those words hitting him in the chest. This is it, Aspen, the moment we sink or float. I want this relationship, but I can't do it alone. What are you willing to do to make us work? Because I'm all in. I'm here, and I'm ready to take whatever crap your parents throw at me as long as you have my back and give us everything you've got. So, what's it going to be? Aspen wiped at the tears streaming down her cheeks. I need to think. Dan reached for her hand, but she pushed past him, heading for the door. You broke my heart, Aspen said tremulously. And to learn it was because of something my mom said? That it wasn't your idea, but you did it anyway because my parents asked you to? That almost hurts worse. When I thought you didn't want me, it was bearable. But to know that you did want me and left anyway? I don't know how to deal with that. Dan swallowed, choking back his own tears. Yeah, well, my heart is still broken. So what are we going to do? Are we going to fight this time? Or are we going to let your parents win? I need time, Aspen repeated. Please, Dan. You owe me that much. And then she was gone. Chapter 13 Aspen made it a block before she had to pull over, unable to see through her tears. She found a mostly empty church parking lot and parked in a secluded back corner, where the trees blocked her car from view. It wasn't like she could go home right now, not with mom and dad waiting for her. Maybe she would pack up her stuff and leave Sapphire Cove tonight, like her parents had suggested. She could be back in Portland with Cheyenne in less than five hours. Aspen hunched over the steering wheel, the cool leather digging into the smooth skin of her forehead, and sobbed. So much of her adult life had been defined by Dan leaving and the hurt that breakup had caused. All of her choices since then, even agreeing to marry Elliot, could be traced back to that moment where time had stood still while her heart had shattered. And the whole thing had been orchestrated by her parents. Enacted by the boy she loved. No wonder things hadn't worked out with Elliot. He'd never stood a chance, not with Dan occupying so much of her heart. Aspen hadn't seen it at the time, but comparing this soul-deep pain to the mere hurt and humiliation of her broken engagement made it clear. Elliot had been right all along, they were friends who loved each other, but they weren't in love. She was still in love with Dan, and she wasn't sure how to move forward. Aspen fumbled for her phone, dialing Cheyenne's number. Hey, Cheyenne said. I was just thinking about you. Is it Sunday yet? The apartment is way too quiet with you gone. You're in luck, then, because I think I'm coming home tonight. Wait. Are you crying? Aspen searched her car for a tissue, but only came up with gum wrappers. She crumpled them together, trying her best to wipe her nose. Maybe. Uh-oh. What happened? Dan happened, of course. Aspen let out a hollow laugh. Guess what I found out? She let the whole story spill out, sparing no details. Cheyenne listened as Aspen told her about the fight with her parents. The even worse fight with Dan. If her parents had known about the miscarriage, would they still have tried to break up her and Dan? Dang, Cheyenne said when Aspen finished. Sounds like your parents happened more than Dan. Or maybe just your mom? Dad might not have known until after the fact, but he totally supported her decision. I'm so mad at them. Dan is right, you know, Cheyenne said. He was only a kid. 
I mean, your mom can be pretty intimidating when she wants to be. Remember when that waiter with the man bun tried to get your number? Dan abandoned me, Aspen said, immediately ready for battle. If he really loved me. He thought he'd almost ruined your life. You were 18 and got pregnant, then lost the baby and were an emotional wreck. He figured your mom knew what was best for you. She lived out that story, right? Minus the miscarriage. Your parents were awful to him. Honestly, it's a miracle he put up with their crap for as long as he did. But. Your real issue is with your parents, not Dan, Cheyenne continued. Don't do to Dan what he did to you. And just what is that? Aspen snapped. Break up because of someone else's actions. How is refusing to be with him now any different than him breaking up with you then? Aspen clutched at her steering wheel, the words slamming through her. I don't know. Yes, you do. Now do you love Dan or not? Because if you love him, then you have to fight for him. You're not teenagers anymore. If you want to be together, be together. It isn't rocket science. But you can't let your parents treat him that way anymore. It's not fair. Aspen inhaled a shaky breath, knowing Cheyenne was right. How do we get past this? You just do. Life is short, so get over your hurt feelings and be with each other. Was it really that simple? Aspen thought of going home, packing in an angry rage, and leaving Sapphire Cove once again. If she left now, she might not ever come back. Could she ever love someone else as much as she loved Dan? Resolve flowed through her, and she jabbed at the button to start her car. I have to go, Che, Aspen said. Dan said he would wait for her, but she couldn't expect him to wait forever. That's my girl, Cheyenne said. Let me know how it all works out, okay? And let me know when you'll be back in Portland. I will, Aspen promised. I can't wait to meet him. We'll talk again soon. Aspen raced back toward Dan's apartment. She barely remembered to yank her keys out of the ignition before taking the steps two at a time to his front door. She pounded on it, just as she had earlier. Dan, she called. I'm sorry. I was wrong, and you were right. I'm ready to fight now. Please open up so I can apologize. The door flew open, just as it had before. Dan stood there, his hair disheveled and eyes bloodshot. His expression was wary, his entire body coiled with tension. You came back. She nodded, a lump the size of Oregon in her throat. I did. I'm so sore. He pulled her into his arms, his lips covering hers. She clung to him, arching her back as he trailed kisses down her jaw. Her hands fisted in his shirt as she urged him closer. This was what she wanted, she and Dan, together, every day for the rest of their lives. I'm so sorry, Aspen murmured in between kisses. Me too. Dan rested his forehead against hers. I was an idiot back then, Aspen. I was a stupid, cowardly kid, but I promise you, I'm done making those mistakes. No, I'm the idiot. I've let my parents walk all over you, and it's totally unfair. But I've got your back this time, Dan. I'm all in, too. She pulled his head back to hers, no longer interested in talking. Aspen wanted to revel in this moment. In finally being held in Dan's secure embrace once more. It took several long minutes to disentangle themselves from each other's arms. Dan held her hand loosely in his, giving it a gentle squeeze. So, where do we go from here, he asked, his breath tickling her cheek. Forward, obviously. Aspen grinned up at him, then turned serious. And the first step is setting boundaries with my family. We can figure out how to do that together. I don't want to push them out of your life. The last thing I want is for you to resent me for costing you your family. I don't want that either, but I won't stand by while they harass you any longer. She rose on her tiptoes, placing a gentle kiss on his lips. You're my family now. Dan blinked quickly, giving an emotion-filled chuckle. I love you so much. 
I love you, too. He led her to the sagging couch, tracing designs over the back of her knuckles, with one thumb. What made you change your mind? Cheyenne, Aspen admitted, as they sat down. She's a great friend and apparently way smarter than me. She convinced me that breaking up with you now because of my parents was just as stupid as you breaking up with me then. She is smart. Sounds like I already owe her big time. Aspen angled her body toward his, hoping he could see just how serious she was. It still hurts to think we could have spent the last five years together. But Cheyenne helped me realize that I'm not angry with you, I'm angry with my parents. I won't let them come between us again. Dan wrapped his arm around her, placing a firm kiss on top of her head. Me either. I was brainstorming ways to convince you to give me another chance. He motioned to his laptop, which sat open on the rickety dining room table, the screen glowing with a website she couldn't quite make out. I was looking for apartments in Portland. Figured it would be pretty hard to chase you from here. Aspen's heart flipped. You were going to move for me? I still will, if that's what you need. She rested her hand on his cheek, the scratch of his whiskers oddly soothing against her palm. I just need us to be together. I don't care where that is. We have all the time in the world to figure it out. Aspen sobered, taking a deep breath, before plunging into what she knew they needed to discuss next. We have to tell our parents about the baby. Dan's eyes held hers, then he slowly nodded. Okay. But why now? Because I don't want secrets to ruin our relationship again. It's time we let them out. Chapter 14 Dan rested his hands on the steering wheel as he stared up at the blue house with the peeling white trim. The porters were inside, waiting. He felt eighteen years old again, small and powerless and not good enough. Aspen reached across the cup holders to grasp his hand, giving it a gentle squeeze. Dan brought her hand to his lips and brushed a kiss across her knuckles. He wasn't that boy anymore. Not by a long shot. Your parents took the news pretty well, she said quietly. Not only that we're back together, but about the miscarriage. He couldn't help thinking, yeah, well, my parents weren't the problem. But he didn't say it aloud because that would hurt Aspen, and he loved her desperately, with the kind of emotion that years apart hadn't dimmed. She squeezed his hand again, giving him a smile that he would walk through fire for. Maybe it won't be so bad. I mean, my mom did sort of orchestrate our reunion. Only so you would get over me. Impossible. Aspen kissed his cheek. We're in this together, right? Right. Let's go. They'd stayed up all night, talking and fighting and making up. Aspen had finally sneaked home early that morning only to sneak out again an hour later so they could speak to his parents. Now it was time to speak to hers, because tomorrow Aspen would head back to Portland for school. Dan already dreaded the separation. He opened Aspen's door, and they walked up to the house hand in hand. A shadow passed before the frosted glass door, the tall, thin frame of Mr. Porter. The curtain beside the door flicked back. Aspen's hand tightened on Dan's. His heartbeat felt erratic, like his body was preparing to fight or flee. But he wouldn't run. And this time, he wouldn't fight alone. Well, there's no turning back now, Dan whispered, his lips brushing Aspen's hair as he leaned closer. Not that I want to. Good, she whispered back. The door swung open, and Mr. Porter stood there, arms folded. You're back together aren't you? His tone wasn't angry, more resigned. Dan would take it. Yes. Aspen lifted her chin, and Dan's heart swelled with pride. No hemming and hawing, just a direct and unapologetic yes. Is mom home? In the living room. Come in. Dan's footfalls sounded too loud on the yellowing oak floors. Mrs. Porter already sat in an armchair, wearing the scowl Dan had come to expect. You weren't supposed to get back together. Mrs. Porter's voice sounded shaky. Aspen sighed, taking a step closer to Dan, what did you think would happen when we saw each other again? I thought you'd realize how different you are. 
that breaking up was the right choice. It was never our choice, Mom. It was yours. Dan's heart twinged with guilt once more. But they'd talked things through a lot last night and both had agreed to stop casting blame on each other. You are miserable, Mrs. Porter said, impassioned. Always crying. When you were together. I wasn't upset because of Dan. Aspen looked up at him, and Dan squeezed her hand reassuringly. This wouldn't be easy, but she was right, they needed to be free of secrets. Of course you were, Mrs. Porter said. That's how it is with high school boyfriends, constant drama. Aspen took a deep breath, facing her parents. Not with us. I was upset because I had a miscarriage. The silence was absolute, somehow loud in its intensity. Dan's ears buzzed with the quiet, and beside him, Aspen seemed to hold her breath. You were pregnant? Mrs. Porter finally whispered. Aspen nodded. Yes. Mr. Porter rose, his face growing red with anger. He pointed a finger at Dan, his tone thunderous. I knew I was right to keep you away from my daughter. Daddy, Aspen began, but Dan held up a hand, cutting her off. He didn't back down. Didn't flinch in the face of Mr. Porter's rage, though his heart pounded and his palms grew sweaty. I love your daughter, sir. And I'm not going anywhere. We don't have to like each other, but one day I'm going to marry this girl. It would make things a lot easier for her if you and I could get along. Mrs. Porter put a hand to her chest. Mr. Porter looked back and forth between them. Aspen wrapped her arm tightly around Dan's, leaning into him while he held his breath. Is this true? Mr. Porter asked Aspen. She nodded, nestling into Dan's side. I love him. We're going to spend the rest of our lives together. Mrs. Porter rose, staring at her daughter. You're sure about this? Aspen nodded without hesitation, making Dan's heart leap once more. Some of the fire left Mr. Porter's eyes. Well then. There's nothing more we can say, is there? No, Aspen looked up at Dan like he was her entire world, and it was like feeling the sun after a long winter. He loved her so much. Please don't make me choose between you, Aspen said quietly. I love you all so much. But if push comes to shove, I'll choose Dan every time. Mr. Porter nodded, his Adam's apple bobbing. Well then. I guess that's that. Dan wasn't sure what that meant, that Mr. and Mrs. Porter were done with Aspen? That they accepted him? When Mr. Porter took a step forward, Dan briefly wondered if Mr. Porter would punch him. But Mr. Porter just extended a hand. It hovered in the space between them as shocking to Dan as a glittery hammer on a construction site. Dan grasped the hand firmly with his own, giving it a shake. Does this mean you're moving back to Sapphire Cove? Mrs. Porter asked tremulously. Maybe, Aspen said. I'd like to talk to you about working at the inn after graduation. Mrs. Porter's eyes filled with tears, but she nodded slowly. Okay. The rest of the conversation was tense, but polite. For the first time, Dan felt hopeful that things wouldn't always be so tense. Before long, Aspen made excuses. Dan was relieved, he figured they'd pushed her parents far enough for one day. Back at Dan's, they cuddled on the couch. Thank you for today, Aspen said. I know we could have kept the miscarriage a secret, but I felt like it was time to come clean. You were right. Dan kissed her temple, relishing the feel of her in his arms. I'm not ashamed of our relationship, Aspen, any part of it. Me either. Her face fell. What are we going to do after tomorrow? Tomorrow, when she went back to Portland alone. Were you serious about maybe coming back to run the inn? Aspen nodded. It's just an idea, but I think it's one worth exploring but I still have another semester left of school. Dan pulled her close, lowering his voice to a caress. I don't know what tomorrow will bring, or the next day, or the next. I'm not sure where we'll be in a week, or a month, or a year. But I do know we'll be together. 
She buried her head in his chest, clinging to him. Promise? Absolutely. I wasn't lying to your parents. Aspen looked up at him and raised an eyebrow. Dan nodded. One day soon, I'm going to pop the question. Because you and me? We were made for each other. And I can't wait to make you mine forever. Epilogue. Aspen hurried from campus, her umbrella doing little to divert the misty spring rain. It had only been a week since she'd left Sapphire Cove, but already she missed it fiercely. Who was she kidding? It was Dan she really missed. They'd spoken on the phone each night for hours, but it wasn't the same. She still had a semester until graduation, but one week without Dan had convinced her nothing was worth being apart. She'd just spoken with her guidance counselor, and he'd helped her figure out how to complete her two remaining classes next semester at the satellite campus only 30 minutes from Sapphire Cove. Aspen wasn't sure yet what she would do about housing. She knew her parents would let her move home, but Aspen didn't yet trust their tentative truce with Dan, and she wouldn't do anything to make him more uncomfortable. If her parents wouldn't hire her at the inn, she would find a job at one of the chain hotels in Paradise Green and get an apartment of her own. Whatever it took to be with Dan. It would be hard to leave Cheyenne, so Aspen was trying to convince Cheyenne to move with her, at least for the summer. Cheyenne needed some space from parenting her mother and Aspen thought Sapphire Cove was the perfect place to get some much-needed clarity about that situation. Aspen hurried underneath the apartment building's portico, shaking the rain from her umbrella before closing it. She only had a month left of this semester, then she could go home to Dan permanently and complete her schooling while staying close. Maybe she would head home on Friday, after her last class. It was a long drive for only a day and a half, and she would spend most of the weekend doing homework but the time with Dan would make it worth the trouble. Aspen slowed as she approached her door, then laughed and ran to the figure waiting there. She threw herself into Dan's arms while he pulled her to him in a tight embrace. Her lips found his, and he returned her kisses eagerly. What are you doing here? she asked with a laugh. Asking the woman I love a very important question. Aspen gasped as Dan dropped to one knee with a grin, pulling out a small wooden box. I would have asked you when you were in Sapphire Cove, but I didn't want to lose any time with you to shop for a ring, Dan said. It was finally happening. Aspen put a hand to her heart, feeling like she would burst with happiness. Dan stared up at her, his eyes bright and his smile a little shy. Aspen, I've loved you since I was 15 years old, and those feelings have only grown stronger with time. I'm tired of spending our lives apart. Will you marry me? Yes. Aspen nodded furiously. Yes, absolutely yes. Dan grinned, slipping the ring onto her finger. Then he bounded to his feet and pulled her in for another kiss. I've waited so long for this, he whispered. Me too. Aspen held out her hand, admiring the ring. Do you like it? Dan asked. If you don't, the jeweler said we can exchange it. No, it's perfect. A square diamond surrounded by smaller square diamonds nestled on a white gold band. She loved everything about it, but especially that Dan knew her well enough to pick out the ring himself. You've made me the happiest man alive, Dan whispered. Did you really drive all this way just to propose? No, he gave her an impish grin. I also have to look for an apartment and find a job. I spoke to my dad and we have a plan to make the business work without either of us. Aspen's eyes widened. You want to move to Portland? I want to be wherever you are, Dan said. And I don't want to spend our entire engagement apart. Good. She put a hand on his chest and leaned forward with a grin. Because I've spoken to my academic advisor, and we've worked it out so I can finish my last semester while living in Sapphire Cove. I'd only have to stay in Portland another month. Dan's eyes widened, then he shook his head with a laugh. Are you sure? I mean, we can talk about this and figure out what's best, Sapphire Cove or Portland. It doesn't matter to me as long as we're together. I don't want to stay here, Aspen said. I've been away from Sapphire Cove long enough. I'm finally ready to come home, with you. 
Cheyenne heaved her suitcase into the back seat of her 66 Ford Thunderbird convertible, feeling an emotional weight lift along with the physical one. She was really doing it, moving to Sapphire Cove. She definitely had doubts over the last few days about whether she would follow through. The image of her mother's body sprawled on the kitchen floor, empty pill bottles surrounding her, invaded Cheyenne's mind like a virus. She braced herself on the car door, taking slow, even breaths. Her mother had landed in the hospital again nearly two weeks ago, but she couldn't get the picture out of her head. Think of the sound of crashing waves, she reminded herself. Think of riding the roller coaster on the pier. Think of bonfires on the beach. It took a few moments, but Cheyenne was able to replace the image of her mom with one of the Oregon coast. Only a few more hours, and her fantasy would become reality. She couldn't believe it. Ever since the engagement, Aspen had doggedly begged Cheyenne to move with her to Sapphire Cove. Cheyenne had wanted to go with an intensity she hadn't felt since her father's death. But she'd said no each time Aspen had asked. Her place was in Portland, watching over her mother. Then came the overdose. Cheyenne had been decked out in her cap and gown, excited to celebrate the end of her college experience. She dropped by the house to drive mom to the ceremony. But instead of heading to graduation, she rode in the back of an ambulance while the paramedics worked to revive her mother. The week that followed was a never-ending nightmare, but at the end of it, Aspen tentatively suggested that maybe it was a good time to get away from Portland. Cheyenne agreed. She'd reached the end of her rope, and putting mom in the long-term treatment center felt like the only way forward. She needed more help than Cheyenne knew how to give. Besides, the treatment center in Harbor Bay was only 30 minutes from Sapphire Cove. Mom hadn't been happy about checking into the long-term treatment facility. Cheyenne still didn't know how she would pay for it. But she had finally realized she couldn't help mom get better alone. Aspen had found happiness in Sapphire Cove. Maybe Cheyenne would, too. She returned to the small apartment she and Aspen had shared, walking through each room to make sure nothing had been left behind. Aspen had left last week, but Cheyenne had needed to wait until the treatment center could pick mom up from the hospital in Portland. Each room was spotless, Aspen had made sure to help with that before leaving, and Cheyenne didn't find any forgotten boxes. At the front door, she paused, giving the space one last look. She'd expected to feel a twinge of sadness at leaving Portland behind. Instead, she felt anticipation. Cheyenne took a deep breath, then shut the door. She was just leaving the apartment's front office, where she'd turned in her and Aspen's keys, when her phone rang. Cheyenne fished it from her pocket, smiling when she saw it was her best friend. Hey, Cheyenne said. Are you on the road yet? Aspen asked. Almost. Cheyenne slid into the driver's seat of the convertible she'd so lovingly restored, feeling her spirits lift further. Just finished up at the front office. We're officially no longer Portlanders. This, moving to Sapphire Cove, felt right. Oh good, Aspen said. You thought I was going to back out, Cheyenne accused. Well, can you blame me? No Cheyenne held the phone against her ear with a shoulder as she tightened the red and white bandana she'd tied around her hair. There's no turning back now. I'm homeless if I don't move in with you. Good, because I need my maid of honor here while I'm wedding planning. I'm so glad you're coming. The bungalow is just the cutest, and Sapphire Cove is so much fun in the summer. I've already scoped out the cute guys for you. Cheyenne rolled her eyes. When Aspen had dated Elliot, she'd seemed content. But with Dan, Aspen was more than happy, she overflowed with joy. And she wanted Cheyenne to be just as blissfully in love. Well, Aspen could look for cute guys all she wanted. Cheyenne wasn't about to date a single one of them. For the billionth time, I'm not interested in a summer fling, Cheyenne said. Who said anything about a fling? Anyway, I've got Dan on the lookout, too. A few guys in his crew might be possibilities, but I'll let you decide who's cute when you get here. The only thing I want to see is a list of places hiring. Cheyenne's chest tightened as she thought of the price tag for her mom's treatment. Money was her priority this summer, not guys. 
Aspen laughed. I've already got three interviews set up for you tomorrow. Cheyenne relaxed. Good. And thank you. Anytime. See you soon? Soon, Cheyenne agreed. She dropped her phone into her lap, then started the car. The radio sprang to life, and Cheyenne laughed at the song, Life is a Highway Sung by Rascal Flats from the Disney movie Cars. How appropriate. Cheyenne slipped on her sunglasses and pressed a button. The top of the convertible slowly folded back into the trunk, the mechanical whirring nearly silent thanks to her hard work. She put the car in drive and pulled out of the parking lot, leaving behind everything familiar. Cheyenne had lived in Portland her entire life. Her childhood home was only five miles from here, and the bulk of her things, furniture and anything else she wouldn't need in Sapphire Cove, had been carefully stored in the detached garage. Her mother was in the Harbor Bay Treatment Facility, settling into a rough week of detox. Cheyenne had graduated college two weeks ago. She had no job, no permanent address, and no idea what tomorrow would bring. As she left the city limits, her hair blowing in the wind and the radio blaring, she didn't feel the loneliness and regret she'd expected. She didn't even feel afraid. Instead, Cheyenne felt something she hadn't experienced in years. Hope. Thanks for listening to Promise to Stay, a second chances in Sapphire Cove romance. Don't miss Cheyenne's story in the sequel, Dare to Fall. You can find the book by visiting lindsayarmstrong.com. Hey readers, I hope you enjoyed listening to Promise to Stay. I had a lot of fun writing this one. Um, some books are really easy to write and this was one of them. It just kind of flowed from me and Aspen and Dan's story just came together really easily for me. So I really enjoyed it. Um, hopefully you did as well. If you want to find out what happens with Cheyenne, make sure you check out Dare to Fall. Um, it's available now on Amazon. If you want me to read that one as well, drop a comment below and let me know. And maybe I'll read that one to you guys as well, because it's not available in audio either. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the book. Make sure to subscribe to my channel and check out the other audiobooks I have posted. And I will talk to you guys later. Bye.